If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this motherfucking episode oh. of Mind Pump. Of Mind Pump. For the first 45 minutes. We're hallucinating. We do our introductory Good. conversation. Psychedelic. Before we get into the fitness stuff. We start out by talking about kinesthetic hallucinations uh that's a real thing it's a new term i learned it's pretty cool we talk about how people can perceive pain or feeling leprechaun create pain uh psychosomatically we talk about medical marijuana and pain and my everly well test now every everly well is a company that provides hormone testing and food intolerance testing and other types of testing online you actually get these kits they're very inexpensive you take the test you mail it in on your own no doctors and then you get your results. That'll help you direct your nutrition and all that stuff. And we also have a hookup exclusively for Mind Pump listler, Let's listeners. Let's hook them up. Yeah. If you go to everlywell.com, enter the code Mind Pump, you'll get 15% off any test. We also talk about the Juve light and Adam's hair. <laughs> it's coming back. Running from Bosley. It's coming back, my friend. <laughs> Taylor's you, really got it out I, for you, bro. Yeah, he is, dude. Uh, he's, com- he's coming after me right this now. This is the know. red light therapy. If you go to juve, J-O-O-V-V dot com forward slash mind pump, you will get a discount because we hooked you up again. We talked about Justin's son driving an ATV. What is he, like seven? Yeah, no, he's eight. <laughs> eight years yeah, old. Yeah, oh, my bad. Father. My bad. I thought it was too young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. We talk about Lane Norton, our good friend, poking at our other good friend. Actually, uh, Adam said his better friend. We're yeah, gonna let's do, duke it out. We're going to have a celebrity death match celebrity on Mind Pump. Match. He was poking Can at, we bring those back? Yeah, we, we should. should. We right? Should, yeah, yeah. He was poking at Ben Greenfield. What's going on here? Should they duke it out? Who would win in that fight? Uh a, an actual fist fight? Oh, Greenfield, All bro. Day. He's like an I got ape. Greenfield. Have you seen his hands and yeah, his limbs yeah, and yeah. shit? Yeah, Lane's absolutely. strong, but uh, yeah. It's not, a his it's not a deadlifting competition. His movement's a little suspect. There's a deadlifting competition. Yeah. Lane's got him. For day. sure. For yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, we talked about childhood cancer and the hyper clean environment. This is actually quite scary. They're connecting a hyper clean environment to childhood leukemia. And then we talked about the radium girls. Little random the factoid. Radium <laughs> girls. This is, uh, yeah, some yeah. some 1927 yeah. knowledge. Yeah. For yeah. Some <laughs> you guys didn't right. know? You remembered the year, dude. <laughs> it's only been an hour. Wow. <laughs> then we get into the questions. The first question was, do we think parents should punish any and all underage drinking, or should we allow our children to drink a little bit this under our room? I make this, them drink the whole bottle. This took us down the rabbit hole. This yeah, was a good one. Definitely did. The next question was, very simply... How do you create the perfect program? And is MAPS that? We actually give you all the secrets. MAPS unicorn. The secrets in this part of the episode. You know that Craig just created, it's so funny you just said that. You know Craig created a program called the unicorn? No, he didn't. Yes, he did. Wow. Our boy Craig. Shout out to Craig. So creative. We love it. (laughs) Uh, The next question was, has CrossFit as a whole done more harm or more good for the fitness industry. Do we all agree on this or not? We've got a little debate kind on this one. Coin toss. And finally... That always lands on no. The last person <laughs> that we answer... <laughs> always. ...is yeah. trying to lose 30 pounds of baby weight a year and a half <clears throat> postpartum. Is this still considered baby weight if it's a year and a half after? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. It might, it might just be body fat. Oh. <laughs> anyway. Wow. Anyway. I, you know, why didn't we call that out? I, I, I know. I didn't realize that either. We just either. did. 18. Yeah. <laughs> you're, doing the math. You ever have some I have a client's like, hey, how do I lose this baby weight? Oh, how old's your baby? Seven. Like, yes, yeah, oh. she's seventeen. Still yeah. working on it. It's not baby weight anymore. Uh. Uh, a trainer at their gym. <laughs> nah, you're just fat now. Said they should do super high reps <laughs> over heavy weight. And is that correct advice, or is their trainer wrong? And should they listen to Mind Pump? Good, so, some good advice here, though. Uh, yes, listen to Mind Pump. You should. Also, this month, get the Intuitive Nutrition Guide and the Fasting Guide. Four, ready for this? Yes. How much does it cost? Free. It's cost, free. Cost nothing. You get it nothing for free. Go to mindpumpmedia.com. Get those two things for free. Oh, here's the catch. Doll hairs. <laughs> I hope you didn't go there before I said this part. <laughs> you have to enroll. You have to buy something. Oh, you have to minute. enroll in one of our bundles. We're not that nice. Now, our bundles are where we take multiple MAPS programs, put, the, put them together, and then we're crazy. We slash the price, slash it 30% <laughs> off. 
So, for Just example, imagine him with a machete. Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking about those uh, those used car commercials where they're slashing things. Yes, like, slashing the prices. <laughs> Look, if you go on uh, mindpumpmedia.com and enroll in a super bundle, Adam will eat his hat. Yeah. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, we discount them. If we multiple programs, we put them together, like the Super Bundle, which is a year of exercise programming. We also have the Prime and Prime Pro Bundle, which we talk about in this episode, at our website or on our website, mindpumpmedia.com. Enroll in any bundle. Get the Intuitive Guide. Get the Fasting Guide for free. Go do it now. I learned a, a new phrase the other day. What's that? <laughs> this is a fucking great phrase. I can't wait to use this in a sentence. <laughs> Kinesthetic hallucination kinesthetic hallucination yes so so i read this incredible article on pain i was gonna say it's like you perceiving you have pain when you really don't yes so i read this incredible article on pain and how it's pretty much impossible i wouldn't say it's impossible but it's highly unlikely or extremely difficult to separate how you the your pain from how you feel about your pain mm-hmm so you create this emotion around the pain, and then that changes completely how we perceive the oh, yeah. pain. It, it reminds me of that TED Talk where the guy was talking about getting bit by a rattlesnake in his ankle. And then, oh, yeah, that's right. I saw and that. then as he um, you know, was, was walking barefoot again mm-hmm. you know, in the same kind of situation, stepped on a, on, a, on a twig, and it snapped, and it sounded like it reminded him immediately of that, that pain, and he thought for sure he got bit. Dude, it's it, it just and by this is a by the way this is a massive part of of your pain, and I think the reason why there's a there's a, a stigma around it is when you when you talk about you know when I say kinesthetic hallucination or I say your feelings around the pain or I say psychosomatic, people think oh you're disregarding me you're saying I don't hurt you know it's not real yeah it's just it's real there's mm-hmm. it's not not real. But the fact that we don't address it, you know how many people I read I was reading this reading this article, I can't remember the statistics, but so many people suffer from so much pain and are on these pain medications when a big chunk of it is really their their perception and emotion around the pain itself. Mm. And this is why so much pain can be treated with like behavioral therapy and or um, uh, SSRI drugs, antidepressants, people will have less pain. Or you know, they'll do studies where my favorite, some of my favorite studies where they'll do surgery on someone like people with chronic <laughs> knee pain, they'll do surgery, but they'll test out a placebo where they'll open the knee up and then just sew it back up and not do anything to the knee. Mm-hmm. And the same amount of people who have that compared to people who actually have the knee surgery feel good. Mm-hmm. So they'll just, they'll see the scar and be like, Oh, oh, my knee feels so much better since you did that surgery. And they'll, and then afterwards be like, we actually didn't do anything. We well, just don't you think too, that's where all these gimmicky products come about because it's like it does work for certain people because they literally believe it and Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of reminds me not to knock human garage or anything but (laughs) definitely like a lot of wizardry was going on you know like in a lot of cues and a lot of like uh, oh yeah a lot of suggestive language that 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 put people in a mindset where they're like oh now my body's reset everything's great and mm-hmm. now i'm not feeling that pain anymore and it's like reiterating those points to the person was so important because they had to little believe it well I, you know i used I, I was as i was reading this article i was thinking about it to myself and i know you guys have had clients like this before too where you train somebody who's never worked out or maybe there's a particular type of personality uh that that falls into this category but they they have like zero tolerance for like the pain that comes from exercise. You know what I mean? Like, oh my God, I can't do this. Oh, it hurts so bad. They, they literally can't handle <laughs> that kind of pain. And then I think of myself and because I've been exercising for so long, the pain associated with resistance training, I have zero problem with it. It doesn't, not only does it not, do I perceive it as not bad, but I actually perceive it as good. So I actually get, be- like I, f- I love it. I enjoy right. the feel of, lifting heavy weights and that kind of pain whereas other people I don't even I, that doesn't even register as pain to that's me that's what i mean yeah. it's like sore it's muscle soreness which to me it feels it feels good in comparison to like what pain feels like it's a completely different association yeah which i think too like that's another part of the process right is like changing that association with the pain but to sal's point i've had many clients that i've trained that you know, thought they were in pain after, you know, if someone that was like never trained before and you Mm -hmm. work them out 
and then the next day they're like freaking out at you like what did you do? You yeah, what me. did you do to me? I'm hurt. Yeah, yeah. I hurt my, my my biceps hurt. You know, they're in pain. It's like Well, well sometimes it must, it, I mean, sure, it's a big shock, you know, yeah. to the system if it hasn't experienced like that kind of mm-hmm. uh resistance and and you know, force. Well, in especially their body. if you have fear kind of going into it too, yeah. right? Like if you already have doubt, you already have fear. It also reminds me of like when you ever do you ever done something where you like slam your finger in a door like really fast. It's so it happens so fast like to register it hurts doesn't register until you look at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Throbbing. Yeah, you're like, oh fuck. Right, yeah. or it's cut open, wide open, bleeding all over the place. But then, but until you looked at it, the pain really wasn't set. Hadn't that set was it. that 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 part of that um, example I brought up with the um, with the snake. It was it was that he didn't really feel the pain because he thought uh, initially it was just he stepped on on a stick. Yeah. But then it, it registered later when he saw the puncture wound marks and all that, and then oh my god! All of a sudden, this rush of pain right. came in. So yeah, it's you know, and it's it's fast. Things like phantom limb syndrome, you know, so fascinating to me. And for people who don't know what that is, this is when somebody has a, an amputated limb, as the most common example. Like let's say you lose your left arm, and then they will so they have literally no arm, right? No left arm, but they will feel tremendous pain in their mm. quote unquote imaginary mm-hmm. left arm. So although they have no left arm, they feel like they have an arm and it hurts and usually what it feels like Now this is this is common with people who have had an arm most of their life and then lost it. Right, right, right. Yeah, right, I would right. think because that, that makes it's sense. not someone who's born. That makes sense to me because they've had this. They have a, have had a memory of for yeah, there's a neural pathway for there. thousands of days yeah. of of you know being connected there and moving there and then to cut that off completely. It's like, but it's just it, it, it highlight because what they'll do is they'll uh, inevitably if they do have phantom limb syndrome, it feels what they'll say is it feels like their arm is in this curled up, clenched just painful throbbing position and nothing you can do hmm. takes the pain away painkillers nothing takes it away and then years ago uh, they discovered that if they put the, their you know their their body up to a what's called a mirror box so that they could see the their right arm the one that they actually have reflected into this box so they could perceive that they now have another left arm except it looks like it's open and relaxed then the pain mysteriously hmm. disappears but this just highlights how complicated pain is and how, yes, there's definitely signals you get from the afflicted area, but it's the perception of that pain mm-hmm. that is what makes you feel it or whatever. And a lot of that is your emotion. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Jessica had an experience like this not that long ago. She she hurt her shoulder, you know, pl- uh, doing the silks, which, she, which changed her life. She did the silks. It was like the first physical athletic thing that she did. She realized that she was very strong, very athletic. She identified very strongly with it. Shoulder became inflamed and and she created bad recruitment patterns, probably caused an actual problem, which meant she could no longer do the silks. So that was a very traumatic experience for her because she had identified so strongly with it. And so now she has this dysfunction in her shoulder, but the emotion surrounding it is made it much worse or turned into like this very depressive type, you know, depression type thing. And then later on when she met me and worked doing all this correctional exercise and whatever, after a while, I'm like, well, your shoulder's moving okay now. Unless you push it really hard, you don't have dysfunction. Everything seems to be moving fine. You've got good mobility for the most part. And we couldn't figure out what the fuck it was. And we had this conversation, this exact conversation. And it was difficult because when I brought it up to her, of course, and I would feel the same way. I'd be like, what, you don't, you think I'm just making this up? It's not real. Yeah. Like, well, no, that's not the point. The point is that You've had these emotions surrounding it. It could be that you're you're perceiving it differently than it is, and I don't even think it's it's a means that she's perceiving it different as much as it could just mean that it's it's more painful than what it should be because you because you're attached to that right. Well, like, here, here's what happened: she started processing it, and God bless her, very smart, self aware person enough to to, to examine this because I could I could totally see how. Being in that situation, you wouldn't even examine it because you'd feel like you were being told that you know you're being dismissed or whatever. But she did. She examined it, thought about it, and processed it, and it literally evaporated, like gone, like. Psh. And I remember her texting me, like I was thinking about what, what you were saying. I really been thinking, and then my pain just went away. And then it came back like a week later. 
She did that processing again, and it went away again. It never came back. Really never never came back. Now, she still has issues with her shoulder. If we push it too hard, it'll start hurting her, but not like it was before. It was this chronic problem that she had for like two or three years. And it just, it just trips me out. And I read this whole article. We should put it in the show notes. I'll make sure to send it to Jackie. But we don't treat pain at all in that context. You go to the doctor for pain, and it's, uh, let's see if there's a, a, uh, let's see if there's a structural problem. And if there is, we'll do surgery um, or rehab. And then if we don't see a structural problem, but you're still, you still feel pain, we're going to put you on opiates. We're going to put you on some opiates and then, and then, you know, hope for the best or whatever. And now we have this, you know, opiate addiction problem and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, but it's pretty, it's pretty crazy stuff. Uh, on that note, I got some interesting other statistics for you. Uh, the Journal of Pain, the official journal of the American Pain Society, reported in June, June of 2016 results from a University of Michigan study. They found that medical marijuana patients were able to reduce their opiates for pain by over 50%. That was on average. And there was another study done in Israel where 44% of patients with chronic pain were able to stop taking prescription opiate drugs within seven months of using medical marijuana. Then there's another study that found that the majority of people now that are starting to use medical marijuana, only 4% of it are using it to get high. The vast majority of them are using it to treat some kind of ailment and replace some kind of wow, uh, wait, 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 drug. Back, you're trying to say that only 4% of people that are smoking weed are trying to just do four, it four percent, recreational? 4% of the new users. Oh, okay, new users. Yeah, of new users that are starting to use it. Um, and I, I believe that- Well, they, I, that's, I mean, that's not that surprising, right? Because the majority of the people that have been smoking weed have been smoking weed because they like to smoke weed regardless of the, the pros or cons of it. And the few, the few, well, it's not few, it's probably millions now, mm-hmm. people that are coming on board and trying cannabis now are doing it because of all the research that's coming out. I yeah, and a mm-hmm. lot of them are using it to replace, because uh, think about it this way, I forgot what the number was, something like 60-something percent of Americans over the age of 30 or something like that, and I, I don't know the exact statistic, maybe Doug can look it up. It's a, it's a, it's a big chunk of Americans. Uh, use uh, prescription drugs on a on a pretty regular basis, whether it's for anxiety, depression, uh, you know, pain, whatever. And uh, a, a, most of the people who are using marijuana as it becomes legal, because I feel like these people who didn't use it before were afraid because it was illegal. Yeah. But now that it's legal, they're like, I'm going to try this out, right? And they're already on prescription drugs. Well, and two, I think. I think as far as like the actual experience of it, like maybe they tried it way back in the day, but it was like the paranoia and like there wasn't a lot of knowledge being passed around as far as like what strains and combinations and even I never even heard of terpenes and until we like met with doses and like their process with that just to to make it more like user friendly as far as an experience. Like if you if you're going for something that's going to relieve pain, there's actually like a good formula for that mm-hmm. not just like you know oh here's some weed yeah no i agree dude this is it's going to be so disrupting because opiate use and sales are in the hundreds of ends up in the billions i mean it's so much it's such a massive market in america mm-hmm. so imagine if you know imagine what can potentially happen to that market with the, well it's already happening mm-hmm. i mean every state that it's legal and the opiate use has been on a rapid decline for some time now and all these other medications too so it's only hey you know what i wanted to ask if one of you guys had done the um everly test yet oh the everly well yeah did you do that yet? i did mine oh you have done it yeah so dude it's super easy Mm-hmm. So what you do, so I did the testosterone one, so I'm not sure if all of them are the same, but the testosterone one- Is it one, saliva? Is it pee? What is it? Saliva. Oh, it's just saliva. Yeah, so you wake, first thing in the morning, in, within the first 30 minutes of waking up, they give you this little tube. It's about, I don't know, three inches long, maybe two inches long, and then you spit in it, and you have to fill the tube up about 75% with uh, saliva. You're not, Don't drink any water, don't brush your teeth, just right when you wake up. So I did it this morning at like five- 5, 10 in the morning, and you just spit in the cup, you seal it, you write your name on it, you register your kit online, which is super easy, you just type in the code or whatever, and then you mail it in, and that's it. Oh, nice. wow. That easy. That's it. You mail it in, and then you get your results. So you, I, I don't know if I told you guys this, but I did an Everly Well test last year in June or July. Let me pull it up. Does um, it keep your old stats? Yeah. So oh, that's cool. I'm going to compare the two. Hmm. I want to compare the two to see if uh, if 
let me see if I can log in here. I'll, yeah, I'll I want to give do, you guys my, my results. I want to do the testosterone one. I had um, the food allergy uh, or food sensitivity test. And so that one, you actually have to like um, extract some blood um, for that one. You're just a pin prick, Just right? a little pin prick. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so I wanted to do that actually for my for my son. I didn't know, you know, <clears throat> as far as like with kids, like using it for that. But I'm mm-hmm. going to have to ask for that. But yeah, I, I'm i definitely going to do the testosterone and see where okay, I'm at. Okay, so- so I did my last one in July on July of 2017. Now the reason I did it, and I don't, I don't know if I ever shared it with you guys. I don't think I did. The reason why I did it was uh, back in last year, um, I was just I felt like my testosterone maybe was low or something was off. My libido wasn't what, like it normally was. I wasn't feeling myself, and I think it was just lots of stress, lots of processing. You know, as uh, as after I got divorced, there's like f- like phases of of difficult periods. Like there's a, the initial period, and then you feel better, and then it hits you again, and whatever. And I think that was part of it, and organizing the the kids and all that stuff. So so I was feeling kind of shitty. So I took this test, and my results then were I was basically right in the middle, uh, free testosterone of the range, which I guess is normal. It says I'm normal, but I feel like that was lower than what I'm normally. Do at. they give you a range of what they say? Is, is yeah, it, is so it they, the standard 400 to 1200. Yeah, no, they use a different uh, different range. Yeah, I think because it's saliva. So the range that they use is between 49 and 185, uh, and I don't know what PG stands for. PG per milliliter. Not not quite sure what that stands for. My number last year was 103, which is kind of in the middle. You know, not not low, not high, kind of right in the middle. Is that really in the middle? It sounds like it's, you said forty nine to what? Forty nine to one hundred eighty five. So it's like mm-hmm. a lower end of the middle. Um, you know, they're I, I I called them. I'm like, what does that mean? This and that. And they're like, no, it's it's fine. It, it, it's totally normal. But I feel like it was low for uh, picograms per mi- per milliliter. Thanks, Doug. What the fuck is a picogram? I don't know. <laughs> it's like a gram, but it's. It's a pico. It's pico. <laughs> pico, pico. It's a, I feel like it's a smaller. Sounds yeah, really, yeah. sounds really small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no idea. Well, I'm excited. I oh, wanna... it's one trillionth of a gram. Hey, pico, we're gonna go. measure. Yeah, that's crazy. I've yeah. never even heard of a picogram. Yeah. 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 So it'll be interesting to see if my testosterone level, because now I feel better than I did back then. So it'll be interesting to see if my testosterone levels are higher. Yeah, the only than last the year. only thing that sucks for me is that I didn't I didn't do this at before, so it's going to be hard to see what you know yeah, com- comparative data. Right, yeah. right. But no, nonetheless, I'm really interested to because I've been trying to stay away from the test for a while just so I could put some work in. You know, like mm-hmm. I don't want it to. Be, it's like when you start working out again. <laughs> yeah, you know, what I'm saying like you don't want to get on the scale. You uh, don't want to. I don't take any pictures. Yeah, nothing, it's like I don't so I get close. Yeah, give me some yeah. give me some momentum here. It's that's right. been kind of like my thought process with all this. Like, let me get in a uh, rhythm them here of training dieting doing everything that i'm supposed to be doing to get myself right and i feel good so i'm excited i'm excited to, to to see where i'm at just to see if i'm what's the turnaround do you know sal like when you send it out like when they're gonna get back I think it's pretty quick yeah. if i recall it was like a couple weeks maybe nice yeah and and you get you get it if you want they'll text it to you hmm. Or of course, oh, cool. or you get an email, of course, and you just go online. Yeah, everything's so nice and like exclusive. Bro, technology yeah. is the internet's decentralizing the fuck out of everything. I, I really, love it. I really feel like Taylor is picking on me with all these new sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> fucking, we just did boner Erectile pills, yeah, boner pills, and now we got Low testosterone tea. tests. Uh, like, you trying to say something, bro? Or like, what's, what's up? Bro? <laughs> He's all getting that. Uh, <laughs> what's up, Bosley? Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yo, fucking, That's coming next. <laughs> I know, <laughs> fucking guy, dude. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he's hammering put you. Put me bro. on Front yeah. Street. He's like, man, well, if, if you're going to get some like skin tanner for me. Yeah. yeah next. He's yeah. like, we may as well oh, get paid you, for you fixing all your yeah. shit, bro. Come on. <laughs> he said Bosley. <laughs> Remember that's Bro, he, I, I swear to God, if he does, I'll tell him fuck off. We're not yeah. doing it. I don't care if I, if yeah. I what if you get this. free. This is my last stand. What if you get free yeah. hair? I've tried Bosley. What do you mean really? you tried it? I did it a long time ago. Or not, it's, it's yeah, it's Bosley does the, the shampoo whole cycle oh, thing okay. too, right? I they, thought you did the hair No, no, no. Bosley also does like a, they have a whole, you know, kit. lot. Yeah, kit. It's like $150 a bottle of shampoo, right? Yeah. And did it do anything for you? So it, it what it did do, which pissed me off was, because it was right when I first- <laughs> The shampoo runs down your back, so you have hairy back. <laughs> <laughs> the trail of tears. <laughs> you Fuck you guys. Oh, yeah. No, this was year like when I first started noticing that I was like thinning. I remember using it, and you know what it does is it 
it like grows peach fuzz. It's like so what I if and you have to be consistent as fuck with it. You can't be missing. You have to be consistent and it took a couple weeks. And then after a weeks I would kind of rub where my hair was thinning and it feels like all this peach fuzz. And when you look in the mirror real closely, you get kind of like these micro hairs that grow. Now, what happens is they never grow full length, at least not for me. I never saw that. And this is, and I've heard a lot huh. of people that have tried this. This is what they, they, they say the same thing is that it just kind of gives you like this peach fuzz that grows in that area, but it's not strong enough to make like full. It's got mondo- It's like a chia pet. It's minoxidil, yeah. right? Yeah, whatever, right? Yeah. So, but when I took it and I was like, oh, this isn't helping very much. Fuck this. And then I stopped. Then when I stopped, it was like my hair started thinning at a faster rate. So it like sucked me in for like a good six months to a year. I was on this. Then I, at that point, I was like, then it accelerated everything. Yeah, it accelerated oh, it when shit. I wasn't doing it. I'm like, this is a fucking hustle and a half. Oh yeah, oh, shit. yeah. yeah. Dude, you start using it, and it's like, eh, kind of notice everything, whatever. But then when you stop using it, then your shit starts to accelerate. You know, minoxidil, which which I think is what's in it. Minoxidil was initially studied uh, for, I believe it was for blood pressure. If I'm not mistaken, I think it was to lower blood pressure, and the people studying it noticed that that there would be like hair growth. <laughs> so, just like just like other medications, the the free researchers are like, well, it doesn't work very well for this. But yeah, wait a but, minute, but there's a boner. This yeah. is a bigger. This is a way bigger market, oh, yeah. dude. dude. I'm telling you, dude, you gotta. I've been using Saul Palmetto I'm cool, bro. shampoo for years. I'm cool. I, just, yeah, I ain't going nowhere. He's rocking it's it. It's good, dude. Yeah. Since I, you know what? Since I don't fuck with it, and I, you know, the Juve light, dude. I'm a believer. Is it growing it back, wow. bro? I'm a, I'm a believer. Wait a minute, is it growing back? Dude, no, it's not growing back. It's, it's just, stopping the accelerator. Oh, yeah, it. like it yeah. stopped. Like I don't feel hmm. like I've, I don't feel like I've thinned in the last. Probably. So what do you do? Lay down so your head is facing it. No, I so like the, like how I I bring. Obviously, the listeners can't see what I'm doing, but mine. I have the juve light at the edge of my bed, mm-hmm. and when I get out of the shower, I'm naked, and I I bring it right over to me, and I sit just like this, and I drop my head down. I'm looking down at my feet, and so it's hitting hitting my my scalp, and then I'm getting all the rest of my body, which is great because right. I have psoriasis on my shins right here. Mm-hmm. So my psoriasis and my my head is like. Right on it, and I tell you what, and I tell—I don't know if I told you guys this, but um, our boy uh, Metabolic Mike, you guys know Mike uh, Metzel, I think is his last name. I'm sorry, Mike. If I oh yeah, 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 yeah. Right, he interviewed us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know this. Him and I talk cool all the guy. time, and he said that he he started using the Juve, and he actually before he started, he he tested his his free test, and it was like right around five hundred and something, and he's our age or a little bit older, mm-hmm. I think, and so it's you know pretty normal range. And he said he did twelve minutes of twelve to fifteen minutes of infrared therapy. I want to say four times a week, three or four times a week, uh, consistently for about six weeks. And then he went back and retested, and his shit went to nine hundred. And something. that's crazy. Damn. Yeah. So he I said have, nothing else changed his diet. Yeah, he said every, everything else. He's been on the, his same same plan, same workout regimen, everything. I believe he follows maps, and so all that stuff has been consistent. And the only thing that he changed was introducing the juve. And I told him, I said, man, you know what? I haven't gone and tested, but you know, I've talked on the show a few times mm-hmm. about how I noticed one with my psoriasis and you know, my, my testosterone levels, I was attributing most of that to the training and getting that going again. But you know, maybe the juve was helping more than I thought it was. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. kind of a, yeah, do, do another, do this test, this testosterone test, do another one in, you know, like three, four months or whatever and see if there's any changes. Yeah, what I really want to play, play with the light and now that we have this kid at home is to see that, you know, if you have to consistently be using it in order to keep the levels there and like, let's say I like fall off and I'm not using it anymore. Probably. Yeah. I would assume so, right? Anything that has an effect on you, you probably have to maintain to keep that effect. Yeah, so I'm, I'm interested to see if that's going to make it. So I'm gonna just, pl- just sunlight. I think it's just it's it's the it's like getting going out in the sun. Sunlight mm-hmm. will definitely raise testosterone, and if you're not in the sun a lot, I think you can it, expect. A and I think reduction. I think that's an important thing to note for the listeners because uh, for sure none of us are like the pseudoscience guys at all. I 100 percent know that I don't get enough sunlight. Mm-hmm. Like we we podcast in a in a fucking cube with no windows, bomb shelter. Yeah, and we and yeah. and we come in early. And I and when I get home, I'm back inside of a house working on a computer. So I get artificial light. I don't get it. and I try and make an effort, obviously, to get out in the sun as mm-hmm. much as I can, or go for my walks and do things like that. But nowhere near the type of sun that I was getting in my my teens and mm-hmm. in childhood. So I think that's probably why I see I'm seeing so much benefit with the infrared sauna and the juve light. I think is because I don't get enough sun. And if I probably was a sun worshiper. 
I probably it probably wouldn't see as many of the mm. benefits that I'm seeing with it right now. Justin, do you get in the sun a lot? I he looks nah. like it. I mean, I try. Like <laughs> as of late, I've been trying real hard to get out in the sun uh, because, like, I do feel the difference, like being in here all the time and oh, yeah. then going home and you know being inside. And I believe people like with his complexion need it less, and course. someone like me needs it more. Of course, I yeah, would think I so. Just go, yeah, exactly. I think otherwise, what would like Irish people always have low testosterone? I don't. Th- I think they have a stronger effect. From a shorter, you know, amount of the sun. Right. I think yeah. people like you and I, who grew up, or Bro, our, our like, heritage goes all the way back to like areas that are. Well, near you the saw equator. how I would know inherently. I'm like, okay, I gotta get out of the sun. Like you guys would still be out there just like baking, and I'm just like, dude, I gotta find some shade. We were at uh, Tom Billy's house, and in between podcasts, we had like a 40 minute break or something like that. So we all go out in his backyard. Beautiful. He's got a, such a gorgeous house, gorgeous uh, backyard. Yeah. And we're laying out, and so I'm like, oh, cool. I'll just take off my shirt and bake. So I lay out there for about 40 minutes. Justin was out there for five and Maybe then goes, five, right, yeah. goes in the shade. In the shade. <laughs> yeah. And there's like one spot for shade. I'm just going to stand right Later there. that yeah. night, you know, we get home and I, I might have gotten a shade darker, a tight, tiny mm. bit. And I'm literally laying shirt off direct sun. It was hot. Justin's neck and head and everything was red. I got like insta farmer tan. Yeah, right away. Yeah. yeah. Right away. Yeah. Hey, it's you so just funny. you just took your kids uh I saw your picture with the ATVs. Where was that yeah. at? Oh yeah. It was at one of their friends' house. I went to go pick them up and uh they had like this little track like in their backyard. It was so sick. It was like uh it went all the way around like the neighborhood and um he just pulled it out he's like oh i got this for them for christmas whatever and so like he he had my son my my oldest go in there and then figure out how to drive and everything and he did really well like he was like nervous at first cuz there's this one part where like if if you would have like turned real hard, he would have gone down this like crazy ditch, and uh, so you just let him by himself. S- yeah, but we were, we were like kind of managing uh, like like from the sides to like kind of get in front of him at least. But uh, yeah, do you remember the first time as a kid getting into a go kart or an ATV or doing oh, anything yeah. like that? Uh, I remember epic. Yeah, I remember. I remember That's being why I was scared nervous. At, I remember being scared at first, but yeah. I remember like getting over that fear and being like, "Oh, I love this." Yes, uh-huh. yeah. He, he he definitely had that like reserve. You know, it's like ah, uh, and like stalled it, and then like tried to get. Get going then once you finally get going like he actually he started turning and he started like putting more gas to the and then i started getting real nervous because he would take the turns really hard and it was like and then you'd see like the 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 tire come up just a little bit and i was like oh shit like calm down you know <laughs> like he i know it's fun he but he calm crash down. it or nothing no he didn't crash i mean he actually I, I take that back he did crash once he he kind of ran into into the wall one time just like couldn't stop in time but uh yeah i was like fuck now they're gonna want this like forever you know, like yeah. once you get introduced to something that awesome, they're just going to be like, Dad, when can we get one? You know, I want one. It's like, it's not going to happen. <laughs> I was yeah. telling Go Ju- to your friend's I house. I was telling Justin that when I was a kid, um, my first experience on like a ATV or a four-wheeler, right? This explains the the quad, the fucking, you know, $15,000 quad. In the your living room, room uh, <laughs> centerpiece. <laughs> yeah, my, my, co- my $15,000 coffee table that never gets taken out, right? Yeah, it so, looks awesome. Right. Yeah. So this, ex- this is where this all stems from is when I was in fourth grade, I went over to a kid's house. It was, it was a new friend of mine at the time who later on became a good friend of mine. And he took me out. His parents let us take the quad out and he was he was a farm kid you know so they would let fourth graders just get on hop on an atv and just fucking take off like so mm. you know i hopped on and got behind him and then we took off and we rode and then he let me drive and i instantly was like in love like yeah. oh my god i want one. so like every year for every holiday i was asking for a quad an atv, I want an ATV. <laughs> and of oh. course my and you were and you were poor yeah I know. Hey, what do you want for christmas adam uh, yeah. i want a quad you know? I, i'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. not it's like kidding. a horse like when kids that would grow so, totally like so a horse. my sister so think about this now talk about it's funny you just went that direction because my sisters and my mom all got horses at one point what? Yeah. Wait a minute. Your sister actually got a horse? Yeah, all my siblings, all wow. of them did. A horse so, is expensive as well, fuck. My little sister had a pony, my other sister got a horse, and then my, my mom and my dad all got horses. When we first, when we got a property up uh, that actually had acreage, right? And that, I mean, but that was like not until I was in seventh, sixth, seventh grade, but from fourth grade, every holiday, all asking, yeah. they got horses. I, I'm still asking. So I asked. Well, they my, get a horse. Fuck yeah. I'm going to ask for ATV. Right. Well, yeah. I was asking before that and during, and I'm like, I don't even want, I don't want a horse. I want an ATV. Like, that's all I wanted. Right. So, and I never got it. So you better believe the first, like, 
purchase that, <laughs> that I made oh, when man. I was making good money. I was like, I'm going out. And it was like that too. So I remember telling my buddy, I convinced him to buy one, which he eventually sold it because he's like, we never fucking drive these things. I got to <laughs> yeah. sell it. And I refused to sell it because I dump a ton of money in it. I'm like, no one will ever give me 15. Is yours all souped up and shit? Yeah, yeah. It's oh, wow. The only reason why it's worth 15 grand is because uh, you can buy it brand new for like 70, 75 or eight grand or something like that. But I've dumped another ten into the thing. It's funny, so. uh, the guy that um, you know, like, like Ethan's Ethan's friend, his dad actually went to school with him, and I grew up with him, and so he was like, I was into sports, like primarily. He was a little bit at some point, but he was like more of the extreme kind of sports that crew, you know, like like growing up like more skateboards and and motocross and you know all that kind of stuff and uh so like over there i just i remembered all that and was like oh yeah oh shit because to me like i i still fight that tendency of like being real like safety caution you know protective like and uh like he's got a lot less of that you know like there's gnarly ass like rope swings and everything he has there he he showed me he's like oh this is super safe blah 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 like he he built this whole um it was like a swing set that you could climb on top of and then you could jump off of the top with this rope swing and then like swing like really fucking high in the air and like he just demoed it from me i was like holy shit dude and he's like yeah try it out it's real fun you know i was like i don't know man like <laughs> i'm a little old for that shit i don't know what you're doing out here you know <laughs> so i got a little nervous yeah i'm the yeah. last guy to do that shit yeah when i was a kid my dad brought home once uh a, like a little 50 the little motorcycles. It was a little dirt bike 50. Oh, yeah, those are fun. Dude, I, I saw my life flash before my eyes on that thing. Because <laughs> I learned how to... That, that's how I learned how to drive uh, like stick shift. I learned how to change gears you through... Use, you mean use a clutch. Yeah, yeah, how to use a clutch through a motorcycle. So I get on that thing and he's teaching me how to, you know, how to, how to use the clutch and shift and all that stuff. And once I got the hang of it, man, that thing would hit like 40 miles an hour. And I remember I'd ride around my neighborhood... And I got a little cocky, and I went up uh, like the curb a little bit. And you ever get the wobbles where you hit the curb and you start? And I was heading towards a car, and I don't know how I missed the car, but I never got on that bike again because I saw my life flash before my eyes. <laughs> I didn't have a helmet on. Nobody ever wore a helmet in those days. I know. Did you guys ever wear a helmet when you were riding? No that way, shit? man. No, I still no. don't wear a helmet. Yeah, <laughs> I was riding like my dad's Honda ninety. It was like this old piece of shit. And, uh, yeah, it totally got out from under me. It hit a bunch of uh, leaves and sticks, like, on this turn and, yeah, road rash all upside my body. It was it sucked. Oh, I still wanted to do we it. We got it all taken. You know, we go down south all the time. Pismo is, like, one of my favorite places to go and ride. We should make a mind That would be trip. hilarious. I would love to make a mind It's been trip. since I was a little kid since I've Well, grown, and the fact so. that your boys now are into that, dude, it's yeah. so fun because you can rent all those things on the beach, man. You go down Oh, there. those little dune buggy thing. Yeah. Like, oh, it's it's super fun, man. It looks so rad. Like, yeah, I would love to do it. They're, they're, they're pretty safe. I mean, I know there's dangers too, but they're pretty fucking safe with the cages and stuff in them. Yeah, the yeah, especially yeah. out there on the beach. and that. I mean, there's, there's only one thing you got to worry about, right? So it's if you're coming towards the water, you got to be careful. Hmm. Well, you, because, don't, you don't want to end up in the ocean? Yeah, no, 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 no. Or excuse me. <laughs> it's, excuse me. It's the other way. It's when it's leaving the water. I'm like backwards. It shows how long it's been since I've been there. Because of the because of the wind coming in, so it makes these drop offs. So as long as you're heading towards the water, everything is up, up, up. Otherwise, you're, you're going the, fucking. When you're going the other way, you can. And I've had buddies that have literally broke limbs because they're, they're mashed in the other direction, and it looks sand. So you just see it looks level, uh, and then you'll come off, and you'll have a, a 50 foot drop oh on, in the sand, and just go wow. off. So as long as you're heading in, heading towards the water, you'll always be shooting up. Uh-huh. So you'll you could hit these, you could bomb on a jump, launch 20, 30 feet in the air, but you'll land up. And you'll keep going up, and you'll oh, keep going up. Yeah, yeah, up. But when you're going the other way, the way the wind blows and makes the makes the lips on the on the sand. It's so I got lost at Pismo in the sand dunes once. Oh, you really? Yeah, I went out there. This was a long was like, walking or riding. No, riding. Oh. I, I was uh, God, this was maybe four years into my marriage. So I, me and my wife at the time got on those little the quads or whatever, and we went out there and we went. We were having a great old time for an hour, riding deeper and deeper into the into the beach. And it looks like everything looks the same all around you. Couldn't see anything around me except for dunes. And then I'm like, which direction do we go? Like, how do we get back? And we couldn't find our way back. And the way I found my my way back was what you're talking about. Was you could eventually I started to figure out that the dunes looked a particular way, 
And I figured, well, the ocean must be this way. So we just kept going. I found the ocean. Then I rode the coast all the way back <laughs> and way back. But I get lost all the time. That's just one more well, example. Well, there, there is not a, it, you, anybody can get lost out there. Cause exactly. You're, cause you're so you right. throw me in there. Yeah, you throw. I almost in, died. In I the, almost died. I almost starved. We need to get GPS on you. Yeah, I would have yeah, been yeah. In, in the middle of the sand. Little cell tracker. Surrounded by like yeah. you know, vacationers. <laughs> you know, it's like two miles away. Not have been dead out on the beach. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Fuck. Oh man. Anyway, so you know, I can't wait to. We have uh, Lane coming in next week. You know what? I can't t- wait to ask him. Hmm. What's that? Why he was why he was talking shit about Benny there and uh, oh, wow. what was he doing on yeah. Joe? I missed uh, you know what he's trying to get on he's Joe just, Rogan. He's, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's trolling hard. God man, I'm gonna I call got, him out. On he's him. been big he's time. been on Joe Rogan's like threads forever. Just he's like get always be like you gotta bring me on. You gotta bring, like super aggressively trying to get on. And you know what? I th- the, the crazy part is he'll never bring him on because of that. Right. It's not, yeah, it's not a good. Or tactic. maybe he will yeah. to fuck with him. Yeah, don't. Yeah. don't. yeah, I think that he won't. I I don't think he'll bring him on just for the simple fact that he's wanting to be on. So it's like, is when someone's asking you that all the time, it's like, come on, dude. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah I would. I would. It. I yeah. would love to have him and in, in Greenfield on a podcast together. That would be a fun one. And then yeah. just just uh, just, just yeah. yeah. I don't know if just it would stoke it. You know what I mean? Yeah, maybe if we were involved in it because I feel like they're so fucking different. Yeah, it like would get it, weird. Yeah, it would get weird, and Ben would. Ben would just not bother with him. Yeah. Lane would probably try and poke at him, and Ben would just kind of be like, whatever. Be aloof. Yeah, he'd just be like, ah. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't think Ben would even care, you know what I'm saying? Like I don't think so, yeah. I just think it would be hilarious. I, what I love about Ben is, and we and this is why Ben is a, a really good friend of ours, right? <clears throat> and Lane's a good friend of ours, too, but I would say Ben's a better friend of ours. And I think, <laughs> you know, it reminds me of when you're kids yeah. and you're, you're like when you're young and you have all your friends around you yeah. and then they're like, who's your best friend? And you've got like four of your friends you around you yeah. and you have to pick one. You're like, <laughs> he's my best friend. You're like weighing him out yeah. like real time. Well, I like, like him yeah. for this. Yeah, but he's got an, he's got a boat. You know, his dad has a boat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. he's, he's a better friend. Right, right. Yeah. No, I just, I think, well, I think we spend way more time with Ben, right? We've, yeah. we've hung out with Ben a lot, like all mm-hmm. of us have. And I think we've got to totally. know him really, really well. And Ben's really, really comfortable with who he is. Like, nobody's going to rattle his cage. No one's going to come in and, like, try and poke at him. Like, he's yeah. not that guy. Like, he fully embraces who he is, what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and, and I honestly, out of everybody we've met, because we've met, all, all, especially in the fitness space, both ends of the spectrum, everything from the fucking woo woo all the way to the hardcore bodybuilders. And Ben really is, if there's anybody who's going to be doing all this pseudoscience shit, he's the guy I want to do it. Yeah. yeah. He is the guy, I mean, somebody that smart who like lives their, their life to do a T like of like protocol, uh-huh. yeah. who is like t- testing things out. Like he is the guy I want to go to and say, dude, tell me, yeah. will you use Press this the boundaries a bit. And, right. I, and I know this isn't, this isn't evidence necessarily, but a little bit it is. Isn't Ben like like our age? He is right. He's, yeah, or maybe he's, yeah. he's a couple years younger. Just is he couple, just like two? I think he he looks he, he looks really fucking good when you look at him. Like his skin looks no, really he good. Looks, yeah. He looks really he lo- good. he's always lean. You know what I mean? So his hair is nice. I sound like I'm. <laughs> He like smells I'm, good. I'm crushing on him. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. Apparently his penis grew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? No, I don't know what they, I don't think they would, I don't think it, I don't know if it would be a good interview or not. Like, I don't know. I haven't heard, I've heard Lane interview because I've listened to his podcast for a long time and he does like all the PhD guys and they just, they do the. That's why, because yeah. they're so, they're so just different. It would echo be fun. chamber. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it would be a blast. Clinical. Yeah. So, so one more thing I wanted to bring up that was. Uh, it's not shocking necessarily, but devastating for for some people to hear. There was a huge study done by Britain's leading leukemia, leukemia experts, and they've concluded, it's a huge analysis, that there's a deadly chain of events that is set in motion that could be causing the most common childhood cancer, which is leukemia. And that is a hyper clean environment. So you know how they've been saying for oh, a long wow. time that a hyper clean environment is could be causing or at least a major factor in the reason why kids develop autoimmune issues like asthma and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And we've known this for a while. These these connections have been made for a while. Well, they're finding now that, uh, and this is thirty years of research that they've that they've studied. So this is a lot of research. And what they think that happens is that children in these hyper clean environments, their immune systems, um become hyper vigilant because they don't really have anything to to yeah, so go everything after. becomes an enemy and so at they some just point. they just develop a shit ton of these white blood cells and it turns into leukemia and when i read that man 
imagine if you're a parent and you're hearing that and you had oh, a kid man. who, you know what I mean? Well, yeah, and especially like because if you're like if you're creating this sterile environment, like obviously you care, you know, you're trying to make sure that your kid is like safe from all these like foreign like substances and and bacterias and whatever mm-hmm. and that's to the, your detriment at that Dude, point. Dude, it's it's so crazy and it just reminds we've had stuff like this in the in the past where like a long time ago, and I can't remember what watch manufacturer it was, but there was these, there were these watches that had uh, glowing hands on them. So they were, they were, you know, watches that people would buy, and that you, the, you know, the, the, you could see the hands really well because they would kind of glow. And the way that they would glow is they would paint, I think, radium on them, which is radioactive. And uh, they didn't know that it was bad to handle this material. And so there were a lot of women that took this job. And what they would do is they'd use these little tiny paint brushes. And they'd paint on the radium, but in between, they'd many times lick the brush oh my to God. create a, a fine point. Shut the fuck wow. up! Where did because you hear this? You this is an old story. This happened in the nineteen, I want to say in the nineteen twenties, maybe or thirties. And all these women it's like were that and mercury. All yeah, all these stories. women were getting cancer. Yeah, and then they realize, oh, it's shit, because you're 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 licking the paint brushes and you're getting this radioactive material. And it just reminds me of like how many times we've had these situations and then realize it was, we were doing it to ourselves, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that this, you know, we're going to, God, I think honestly in the next how 10, can we 10 not, to 20 years. How can we not think we're doing it to ourselves when mo- a lot of this stuff didn't exist a fucking hundred years ago? Yeah. That's the obvious like, thing, right? Like to me, it's like, that's like, so I think when people play this, like, oh, um, I hate. I yeah, hate, the radium gl- g- girls, that's what they call them. I hate wow. hearing this, like, oh, my genetics are oh this all the time. It's like, dude, it's so crazy. Half the shit that we're all talking about that we're suffering from, like, we weren't suffering from this a hundred years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't make it doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, we so. just want to control our environment so bad, and it's just like we create new problems well, as a result. This is it. Like, why are we in these hyper super sterile clean environments? Where did you read the, this, dude? This what a random fucking fact. That right there. I, I, I didn't. I must hear have read that. it a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> like, was pretty hey, like in nineteen thirty something. Hold on, I want to see. That's, if like, I, that's like a fun fact. Hold dude, on, I want a Snapple cap. I want to yeah. see if I if I was right with the years. What years was that? What did that happen? They call them the radium girls. I mean, it's black and white. Nineteen twenty-seven. Damn it. One day I'll be wrong. You were so, <laughs> the radium girls. I feel like there's a song. They sound like they're. Uh, it sound like they'd be hot, right? Like, hey, yeah. you want to go meet the radium girls? For, like, for sure. I mean, radium. For girls. sure. One of the things that people that meet us are most impressed with, aside from that, they're like, "Oh my god, you're exactly the same as you are on the fucking show." <laughs> Besides that, is yeah. holy shit, Sal really doesn't have a laptop in front of him when he says all this oh, yeah, weird random shit. Oh, I know. No, people always think embedded that. in your brain. People no. always think that. No, no, I don't. I'm not looking at shit. But anyway. Um, you know, we have these hyper clean environments because we've been told we were we had, we discovered germ theory. We discovered that bacteria and viruses exist, and that's what makes us sick. And so immediately, what we did is we fucking tried to eradicate them, yeah. eradicate them from everything. That's the enemy. Let's get rid of them. Yes, that knee jerk reaction, and now we're seeing that that has caused its own problems. Mm-hmm. And so it's just. God, how often are we going to, how many times are we going to learn this lesson? Isn't that crazy? I know. And it's like, uh, that's why I'm like, go outside, go play, get dirty. You know, it's, it's fine. I mean, we'll wash <laughs> Justin it intentionally doesn't yeah. shower his kids. <laughs> yeah. Like drink tap water, you know, like just like, why, why are you like being such a purist about all this shit? It's not really yeah. like that good. Like prove to me that that's a better method. Than, yeah. You know. yeah. 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 No, I'm with you. And it's. You know, we have to learn this. We we keep having to learn this lesson where we discover something, and we say, "Oh shit!" And we 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 go we overreact mm. and don't realize that th- that there's a balance that has to be found. Um, God, you know, cholesterol is a good example of that. Like we we discovered a while ago that when arteries are clogged, it's the cholesterol that's clogging the arteries. So we overreact and we're like, "Oh fuck!" Hammer the fuck out of your cholesterol, lower it like crazy because that's what's going to cause problems. And now we're starting to realize that that's actually causing more problems itself. You know, do you, you have to ask yourself though: Was it necessary for us to do that to figure that out though? Yeah, just you know like just I, like back in the day, like I mentioned the Nick, like where they're trying to figure out like these procedures, <laughs> like it, and like they man, so many people died because it, it's it's part of the process of like figuring out. Well, this happens, so then this. And oh my God, <laughs> here's that's, Kyle. <laughs> that's why. That's why when we do like these, like when we talk about these like extreme, extreme things, like it's almost like as humans, like we have to do that. We have to go through that stuff in order for us to piece it. You know all what together. it is? Yeah. S- s- humanity and society is like a. Ch- it's like a child. This clause brought to you by Organifi. 
For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. Our first question is from Danielle2000. Do you think parents should punish any and all underage drinking or allow their minor children to drink under their own roof? Ooh, interesting question. Yeah. You know, I have a, so I have this kid that I went to high school with. I'll never forget Kenny, good buddy of mine. And his parents used to allow him to drink. And it used to drive me crazy because my I absolutely could not right. I was going to hell if I drank. So uh, it was not not really. That's an I was gonna say. What about wine, yeah. dude? Yeah, no, no, that, that's an hell. exaggeration. Jesus made water. But and we wine. we absolutely Jesus were not about allowed to to drink uh, to underage drink. But my my good friend Kenny, his parents would allow us, and the rule was if we were at their, they had we had to drink at the house. We all had to give them the keys, and they would allow us to do it. Now the thing that drove me crazy was as a, as a high school kid who was introduced to alcohol, it became the thing that we did every every Friday or Saturday. It was like, who do we have to shoulder tap or where are we drinking at or whose parents are out of town so we could go to their house. And we always had Kenny because Kenny didn't have to have his parents out of town because we could technically go drink there. But Kenny never wanted to drink. Good he, old he, Kenny. He was a 4.2 GPA student, fucking hella smart. He didn't like, care. It wasn't a big deal. Yeah, it wasn't a big deal because his parents had always allowed him to do mm-hmm. that. So mm-hmm. it was an interesting example of... You know, and I'm not to say that that works for every no. every parent because I'm sure there's. You some- hear about that, like in Europe, there's that sort of mentality where it's always around, right? Like it, with dinner, there's wine, and you know they'll have like allow their kids to have a sip, and um, it, it's almost like the, the stigma of it and and the taboo sort of vi- vibe around it is just completely different. I think that. I mean, it is, there's something to that for sure. Obviously, you know, I, I have a little bit of reserve and a problem though with like having other people's kids over and like, yeah, yeah, my house is the one where everybody's like drinking. Like, I don't like that at all. I don't think I would condone that either. I yeah. think that I would allow my my kids that I don't have, right? Yeah. I would I would allow them. To- <laughs> yeah, yeah, your hypothetical. <laughs> my, yeah, my pretend kids. Yeah, Adam number two. I, yeah, I would let my pretend kids uh, experiment with that with me. And under my roof or with me in it, wherever we're at, what, you know, if yeah. we're on some tr- vacation or trip somewhere, right? And uh, I would allow, I would allow that, but I don't know. I don't think I would like Kenny's parents a lot. Although, I, what was crazy was because they they taught him responsibility, you know. Mm-hmm. And I remember, I remember being the young kid who was always looking to get in trouble on a Friday, Saturday night, and asking Kenny like, "Hey, dude, let's go to your parents. We have nowhere to mm-hmm. party or drink." And he's like, "No, no, no. We have. I've got a test on Monday. I've got to study." You know, and I remember being like, yeah. motherfucker, See, dude. It's not that cool. Right, yeah, right. like Kenny's mentality. A large chunk of the reason why teenagers do shit is because they're rebelling. Yep. It's that whole taboo, 100%. If it's not taboo, it's not really that big of a deal anymore. I agree. And that's, look, statistically speaking, kids will rebel against what their, hard, what their parents are most hard on. You know, the mm-hmm. most difficult thing that they that the parents are on with them is tend what they tend to rebel against. And look, the facts are this. In America, American teens binge drink at much higher rates than they do in Europe. Uh, actually, binge drinking is worse in America than anywhere else. Now, in, in a lot of European countries, like in Italy, alcohol is a, it's a family affair. And kids drink you know, with the parents and people have wine. And, they, it, and the other thing, too, is I remember the first time I drank alcohol. So in my... In my house, nobody drank alcohol. So we, we were not like the typical Italian family. We didn't have beer or wine ever. And it was very taboo in my in my house. Now, the first time I drank alcohol or really drank alcohol, I was, I think, 19 years old. And I didn't understand the consequences of drinking. I knew you got drunk. I knew you could get sick. But I wasn't experienced. And so what I did was I was with my, at the time, one of my mentors bought us some alcohol and I drank it, and I started feeling good. So what I didn't know that what you drink now takes a, right. a little bit to hit you. So I kept going, and I got fucking sick. I got super, super sick. And I, I, I think that – and, like, ask me now how often I get sick when I drink. Never. I never get sick when I drink now because I know my limits. I know my body. I understand the, the consequences. And I feel like I would have I known that had I drank with my parents and where someone was there guiding me, explaining to me. And it wasn't so so taboo. So for me, for sure, 
what with my kids, they're the first time they drink or do whatever or anything else that's legal like cannabis. I'm gonna I, I already I'm gonna do it with them and I'm gonna talk to them about the consequences and what can happen. So the question is, as a parent, do you? Is it you? You wait for that question to be asked, and does it matter mm-hmm. what age when they come to you? Like, does your does it matter if it's your eleven year old asking you, or does it matter if it's your fifteen year old who's asking you? Like, where do you where does that line for you guys? Because what if you're oh, what's the age? Yeah, yeah. Like, what, I I think for for me, it's always been just putting like downplaying a lot of like being really responsible with me and my wife, like when we are drinking, like they know that it's, it's a alcoholic beverage. And like, it's interesting because <laughs> you get that immediate feedback of like, Oh, like, Sal was wrong. It's, it's in Canada. No, huh? you know, so, you know, it's funny about this. So I've seen several studies that say that America has the worst, uh, binge drinking. So I, I'd be interested to see what this article that Doug pulled up that says that, uh, that Europe has worse drink teen drinking problems and how they're quantifying that, like what that means. Yeah. I know the drinking culture in Europe is a little bit different in the sense that it's more it's it's more of a social thing, more of a family thing in some countries, um, like in like I said, like in Italy, for example. But I mean, here's the way I'd like to treat everything. I definitely well, think I definitely think it all should fall. Whatever we agree, like as a society, is an adulthood for somebody. I think that they all should fall under that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, I think it's, I think parents should be able to to handle that, you know, and have autonomy with that. Yeah. However, they fucking want to. You know, like this is their their family. Like it's 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 literally how they. The scary part is want that to set them up. For the that. scary part is that there's a large portion of kids running around that aren't being parented. Yeah, well, that's so. That's, therefore, that's there's got to be something yeah. in place, right? Because otherwise, those kids are going to run amok. You yeah, know I mean? and I, and and I I just think that I think it's it's a it's a something for the family to handle. I think if you want to talk about drinking age in terms of legality, I think it's absolutely insane that we trust Dude, an 18 year old Denmark off the charts uh it's part of their culture but you know this is percentage of 16 yeah. year olds who report being drunk which isn't the same thing as binge drinking getting sick and going to the hospital it could be you know ask a bunch of 16 year olds hey have you ever been drunk I'm like oh yeah i felt well I, that's tipsy. a good i think that's a good measure i think asking a 50 cuz i didn't binge drink when i was a kid and you i didn't was didn't get re- sick when you first started drinking will make you you drink till you got sick well yeah sure we did that but i mean i i don't i mean being drunk versus what you're saying that that's can, if you throw up you're considered a binge drinker. You know what? There's mm-hmm. a there's a statistic, there's a, a way that they define binge drinking. Because I think being drunk is pretty yeah. much what every kid was okay, chasing. So, it wasn't like let's let, I'm a so the the uh, National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism defines binge drinking as a pattern of alcohol consumption that brings the blood alcohol concentration level to 0. 0.08 or more. So for females, typically it's by consuming four or more drinks within two hours. And for males, it's five or more drinks within two hours. So if you're a guy in I, I, average, feel like, I feel like a kid that's being asked this, if you're a 15, 16-year-old kid and you've been asked if you've been drunk, you would connect the same thing. Like, maybe. Because as a 15, 16-year-old kid, that when I because that's about the age when I first experienced drinking and trying to get drunk, it was a race to get drunk. It wasn't like you were... And so if you were to ask me this same question here, I would say, yes, at 15, 16 years old, I have been drunk before. And uh, if you ask me, do I think I binge drink? I would probably think, no, I don't think I'm a binge. Because I think as a kid, I would probably think that binge drinking is this like, you know, thing that you do every single week, well, every single day. And you're and- well, look at it this way. Like, let's talk about sex. Like STD rates tend to be higher where kids are in environments where sex is super, super taboo. So they don't learn about condoms. They don't learn about preparation, and it tends to be these random acts of whatever where they where they have sex, and you get STD, you know, uh, rates on the rise and teen pregnancy and stuff. I think all subjects are like that. Not that I not that you should sit down and have your kids do whatever. I think just being honest. Yeah. Like just be fucking honest. Like don't don't you don't have to demonize everything. Like my kids asked me. I had this conversation with my son about all drugs, and he went down the gamut of drugs. And at the end of it, I, you know, I told him the same thing with all of them. I said, look, and I did go into the science on each one and how people do them. And, you know, people tend to do heroin with needles and here's the problems with that. And people tend to do cocaine this way because he, he had all these questions. But at the end of it, I'm like, look, people do these drugs because for whatever reason, it makes them feel good. Or many times it makes them feel like they forget about the problems because they're they're escaping or whatever. And there's a there's a abuse potential with all drugs, and some drugs have higher abuse potential than others, and there's also the risk of the law 
that's higher with some drugs than there is with others. Like if you're old enough to drink alcohol and you drink alcohol, you have a very low risk of going to jail because of it. But if you do, you know, a drug like cocaine, the risk is much higher because it's it's very illegal. So I'm just being super honest with my kids. And I feel like that's better than doing the whole like fear thing or taboo thing like sex. Like if we talk about sex, the way I talked about, and again, I talked about this with my son because he's older. As I say, look, you know, I know that you, you, you know, you're the, you, you go to Catholic school and they talk about waiting till you're married. And I understand that, but you also know that I live in this house with Jessica and we're not married. And I said, I think the reason why that rule was made is so that people waited till they were serious and they really had a connection with someone and it meant more than just the physical act of sex. I said, when you just right. do the physical act of sex, very few people can do that without having, you know, detrimental effects you know, if they continue to do that for long periods of time. So it's really about respecting yourself and respecting the other person. And I'm just being totally honest. Sex feels good. This is why people do it. Uh, but there's much more to sex than just the feeling of feeling good. There's the connection that you can get from it. And I'm just being totally honest so that they can make a more educated decision. Because otherwise you get this taboo where you think it's so bad. Then you get exposed to it. You rebel. You try it. You think your parents are liars. and They don't know what they're talking about. And then you start to go in the opposite direction where you, you know, you kind of go crazy. And I think that's what happens with alcohol. Like if you drink, like if, if my son says, hey, can I try some of that beer? Yeah, you can taste it. And then he's like, oh, it's gross. Yeah, I know it takes a while to get used to the, the flavor or whatever. Why do you drink it? I like the taste. And when you get a little bit of alcohol on you, you start to feel kind of relaxed. And But I don't drink it often because of this, that, and the other. There's no like what's wrong with being totally honest? Like what are we afraid of when we tell our kids? Well, it's what what everyone's afraid of is the reflection, bro. Yeah. That's, because because yeah. when you when you're somebody who says something like that, you say that because you manage all those things, but let's be honest, half of America or more doesn't mm-hmm. and they need 3 to 4 glasses of wine every night and their kid sees that and mm-hmm. they know inside they feel guilty yeah. and then your kid asks you about it. What are you going to say to him? Yeah, mommy or daddy has uh, uh, hates his work mm-hmm. or hates his wife or hates his husband. And so I, to take the edge off, I drink, you know, four glasses after dinner all the time. Yeah. And so it's interesting you say that because I had a conversation with one of my good friends who like he saw that sort of reflection. He saw that feedback that he was getting like, like, oh, dad, you're having another, you know, margarita or whatever, you know. And, and then he just was like, oh, wow, this is mm. this is scary. And so all of a sudden now the whole household, there's no alcohol and there's this dry, like, you know, he had this like panic moment. And I thought about that. It like resonated with me. And I was like, because my kids see me drinking, you know, every now and then and like and me and Courtney. And it's like, uh, you know, is this something that they should be seeing frequently, this and that? But like at the same time, it's it's casual it's i was like no you know this is who i am like i'm not trying to like yeah i'm not i'm not abusing it i'm i'm an adult i'm doing this responsibly like is this something i'll I'll do well the question the question becomes when they they start asking right and that's where i feel like the dialogue needs to happen with them though you can't like you know shy away from it right yeah like my my daughter and and i think where most people struggle is you know and even you saying that right now there and what's great about someone like you though i think you're open-minded to this possibility that you know, maybe you don't know or don't realize that they are connecting that dad has a drink X amount of times mm-hmm. and and they're paying attention. Mm-hmm. And one day they do decide to ask and you will have to answer your, like you'll have to answer, which you probably will, but it'll also cause you to kind of probably reflect a little bit and go like, dude, I'll be completely honest. Like I, I had a, I had to check myself cause I was like, oh wow, we've been ramping it up because we've been stressed and our household has been like chaotic and we were drawn to wanting to drink, yeah. you know, and they noticed it and it's awkward, right? Cause you're like, oh shit, you know, they're, they're paying attention, but then you just like you work through that, and you're like, okay, well, well I, 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 like I internally calm down myself, and and then I, you know, sparingly I'll I'll, I'll reintroduce it, but like, yeah, uh, it's it's fine. That's feedback to me is, is how I look. I right. think I, I think I think you, you another good point about this is say what you want. It's how you act that really makes the big impact. Yeah, and if you're at home and you're having a, a little bit of wine with dinner, and it's normal and everybody's whatever and it's fine. That sends a very different message than dad is angry. Yeah, until I don't he know if you beer. can even say that though. What, what I mean, this I don't. I look at wine, cannabis, scotch drinking, all the same to me. Sure. And I told you just recently when we were talking, and I told you that I'm going to do like the 30 day fast from cannabis. 
And you're oh, why? Well, it's, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, I know that there's a, a, a good possibility that Katrina in the, in the next year or two, her and I could be pregnant. And I most certainly will not have cannabis in the house. Like I, I just, and not because I think it's evil and it's wrong and I feel guilty for all that. It's just, I don't want my child to see that dad has this even because at that age, I don't think they can process everything that I can and understand that. And when the time comes, it doesn't mean that I would run away from that. It doesn't mean that I would like hide it and deny it. It just means that I don't want them exposed to it all the time because I, I don't want their little brains to formulate that this is a normal thing in an okay pattern because they may not be, they are not, they're not developed enough to say, Hey, you know what? Like, dad is just relaxing and that's how he relaxes. Well, what if I want to relax and I'm yeah. a kid and they don't understand that the same. So. I don't even know if they, if they, if they consciously will even make that. Yeah. I'll give you another example. They don't. It's probably subconscious. I'll give you an happen, example. But it's being, it's being cemented in there, bro. Yeah, but it's how it's done. Like, here's an example. Nudity. Okay. Is it okay to be naked around your kids? Depends on how, why you're naked and how you're naked. Mm. Like getting out of the shower and whatever and just being naked or whatever. Not a big fucking deal. But, you know, being funny about it, whatever, very inappropriate. Like, you know, if, if, like I said, if it's a part of whatever and there's no dysfunction in the house, like if people are drinking and acting crazy or if dad's pissed off until he has his drink mm -hmm. or mom is getting hammered at night because she's whatever, that, that is very different than you're having a beer, having a wine and it's like a normal, yeah. not a big deal. Like right. there's a very big difference in, in, in yeah, what happens. Yeah, but you just said it again it. right there. And that's where I interrupted you last time is that it's a normal thing. What does that mean? Like it's very normal that we have to take I have to take the edge off with with a substance every night. No, I don't think every night. I think every night might be too much, but it depends on the family and the look. I have, I have family members, cousins, who you know when I'd go visit them in Italy, wine was at dinner most of the time. Most of the time, dad would have a, a glass of wine. I don't. There wasn't any dysfunction there that I could see. It didn't seem that way. It wasn't like he was getting smashed. It was literally mm -hmm. a single glass of wine with dinner. Now cannabis might be a little bit different because it's smoke and you do get high off of one hit. And I don't know if it's necessarily the same. Maybe I'm brainwashed because cannabis has been sure you are. You know, has sure been, you are when yeah, you look at which one. When you look yeah, at stigmatized. When you right? look at what what the potential that the pathway of drinking alcohol on a regular basis can lead to as yeah. far as dangers, mm -hmm. it far outweighs cannabis. It does. Yeah. So I, I I definitely can't I I disagree with the just the normalization of it as just saying that it's no big deal when when in reality the reason why I and I'm not judging by no means yeah. right now. This is me just having open dialogue sure, with you guys sure, sure, sure. because it's something that I've thought about how I would handle that because I I am 100 yeah. percent pro cannabis, and it's something that is well, a, a yeah. part of my life. But then also, I'm also aware enough to know that, you know, as a young child, and I and I feel like I feel passionate about this because I see what happened to my brother. Like I see mm. my little brother right now and the pathway that he's going down right now, and it breaks my heart. And it breaks my heart because I know that he has an older brother who was involved in the cannabis business, and when he experienced it was years before I did. I didn't until my late twenties when I was responsible as mm -hmm. fuck. And I understood it to a much deeper level than he does. And I've now watched it consume his life, yeah. you know? So I don't know, man, I, I have a really hard time with just justifying it and saying it's normal to have a drink every now and then. Well, and, well, and, and to say, to, well, think about it this way. Like, you know, let's say, you, you, you know, dad has pain, or mom has to take a medication for something, and so she takes her prescription drug every single day in front of the kids. Versus just, just as bad. Versus just as a, bad. Versus hitting a joint. Well, it, which is it bad or is it? I don't know. It's it's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I think I, I don't know. I don't know how you can. I think it's impossible to do this blanket. Like I know what dysfunction is when I see yeah. it. Right. I, I think I think it's just becoming aware. Like again, yeah. like I think so, it's becoming aware and like like paying attention to the feedback you're getting because. You're still who you are, you know, mm -hmm. like going into being a parent. It's not like all of a sudden you become this, this fucking like model example. Yeah, but I would debate that right there is that part of who you are is an, is I'm less aware. Mm. And now becoming a parent, I, I'm becoming hyper aware because now I have a, re, a yeah. tiny mini reflection of myself. Yeah. Sure. And, and what I thought was normal. But before, do you hate that about yourself or do you not like, is, is that something you enjoy and you don't feel like that's, that's a detriment to your character? I don't know. That's something you have to ask. Each, right. each person has to ask themselves yeah. individually is that, is this enhancing who I am or is it? 
I think that's really the question. Yeah. So it's like that's how I deal with it from going forward. Is like, do I not like that about myself? I don't want to present that in front of my kids, so I won't. Yeah, I, right. I, I would have I would have to say that if you're unless unless you have medicinal reasons for it, I would I would say generally daily use uh, of of cannabis and alcohol or anything is probably for that matter, yeah right? is probably not is probably not good. Yeah, it's I, a little bit of dependency. It seems. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm I'm like a three day a weeker, four day a weeker. If I don't have the kids, definitely. If I do have the kids, sometimes, and it's after they go to bed, and it's, you know, outside or something like that. But yeah, it's a good question. It really is. I, I think it does require a lot of self reflection. Mm-hmm. But in terms of discussing and talking, you know, and and in, the reality is they're going to be exposed to things. The reality is that yeah, hundred percent. If my kid comes and he say, asks dad, yeah. you know, like. I'm really curious about drinking, like, son, Friday night, you and I, we're going to sit down and we're going to drink and we're going to talk all about it. I think that'd be fun. Yeah. (laughs) I I, I 100%- I can't wait. I 100% would be that way, like, if he can't- Well, I just know coming, and and I had a very similar experience growing up, it was so taboo. Like, even in, there's like, my mom made a point of, like, putting, like, little, like, like, post-it, like, magnets and things that were just, like, like, demonizing all alcohol consumption and, like, having, like- drunkardness is prohibited in this household and all this shit. And I was the only one that was like, you know, I tried it and I actually liked it. You right. know, like, oh my, I'm a fucking demon now. You right. know? <laughs> no, but I was like, no, I'm a good kid. It's not like what you guys had made it out to be. And you and I, you and I connect on that level because we were very similar with that, which also makes me though reflect even more on myself because I know because I was raised a certain way on one extreme that I'm going to probably lean towards the other extreme almost as a fuck you. Right. So you want to check yourself on the rebellion. Right. I, I struggle with that too. Right. Sure. Right. So you're, you're going to question. I mean, you end up questioning everything you do. Like, exactly. Am I watching TV too much in front of the camera? Yes. I, did I yell, you know, did at the I remote control? And, and I have yelled and, you know, I've, I've raised, yeah. you know, like it just happens. Which is it's all good, part of it. Which is good, I think. Totally. That, because you guys are, again, and that's why I was saying, you know, with Justin, like I know that no matter what, when that time comes, I know that he's the type of person that will really dive deep into that instead of just saying, because I told you so, yeah, or yeah. daddy does, you don't get to, you know what I'm saying? Like instead of, I know none of you or neither one of you or father or all three of you, for that matter, with Doug, are father others like that so i think it's cool but it's definitely something that i've thought long and hard about as far as you know how would i uh, how would i monitor i would change what i do which i don't think is changing me i think it's just being a responsible adult and having a child who doesn't have Mm -hmm. the thought process like you have i think i would change the way i i smoke cannabis now i would right now in in the freedom of my home and i have adults and stuff like that in there all the time i'm fucking burned right in the middle of the living room and i have an ashtray out i'll leave a half joint in there because it's my fucking house i'll do what i want to do but if i did have a kid inside there it's different i have a i have a lock i have a lock box timing with that you know that conversation i feel like that opportunity that's one of those yeah they're they're too young like that's something that needs to happen a bit later but it will happen yeah hey buddy do you know what we yeah (laughs) (laughs) it's like Like, it's not time (laughs) dude luke's story right fucking luke was was snorting cocaine at eight dude that's what floored me i mean i was just like oh my god i can't even imagine it's like unfathomable to me it's terrible no i i keep everything in a lock box because it's it is a it's psychoactive substance and i do have sometimes edibles and i hate this about edibles they're all fucking fruit flavored like chocolate, chocolate fucking candies what a dangerous thing to keep in it they won't kill your kid but for sure if one of my kids ate that uh, on accident i would that's gonna be an experience it would They'll destroy remember. my heart oh yeah. Yeah. terrible yeah. next up is via nathaniel how do you create a perfect program yeah how to create the perfect we don't workout know. program. Yeah. I know. We, we seriously Does that don't exist. Yeah, no, it is. doesn't exist. It Actually, doesn't I like exist. that you you picked this because I think the person would probably assume that we'd sit here and probably break down yeah. how that's done. Well, th- well think about this. Naps I, perfection. Yeah, when, when I thought about this, I thought, okay, here's what we do when we create a program is when we create a program- we get really high. Yeah, and then no, we go, oh, no. No, sorry. <laughs> right after that last question too. Yeah, yeah right. I, I think we all think about- Dad, how did you write maps? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, we we'll all, talk about that when you're 18. Yeah. <laughs> we all think about the person that we're trying to create the program for because as trainers when I used to create programs for people there was a whole process we created of- programs for the majority instead of creating things that we instead of creating programs that played into people's insecurities mm. that is the major difference of where we, and by no means is our program 
any more perfect than another person's program. It's that through the years of experience between the three of us, the thousands of people that we've trained, we know what a, a majority of people, what they struggle with and what they need to work right. with or what they need to help yeah. on, what they're not focusing on, what they should be focusing on. And so with that information, we have what we call expert programming. And the other side, the, the, other, the other types of programs that are out there, we're designed based off your insecurities yeah. because you want to look like I look or you're trying to do this. And so I'm, or you want it, you think it's a exercise you're missing. So I throw in all this creative shit in there that you've never seen before. Like that's how most programs well, are done. We've just seen physically what, what works best out of like, and, and then, you know, just to mention all the thousands of people I've trained personally, Adam's trained personally, Sal's trained personally. It's, you just, you just see a pattern that emerges and you start to kind of pay attention to like certain exercises, you you know, the cadence of the workout, um, you know, what they're coming in with that they pre-existing have already as far as like postural concerns and uh, the way that their movement, you know, mechanics, what that looks like, you know, their stress levels, uh, what state they're in emotionally. Like <laughs> there's just so many variables that, um, you know, if you can kind of deduce that whole process down to, you know, a few things to focus on and, and then sort of build around that and like build outside well, of it. Let's, let's talk some nuts and bolts here, like yeah. of maps, right? So something that, I mean, and I remember when Sal first sent this over, it's how, it's how I, why we were, we're all together is because I saw it and right away and was like, this is brilliant. And this is the fucking message that should be given to people right now, because this is a majority. Now there's nothing there uh, for sure. There's somebody who buys maps and then buys some other program that's nothing like maps and they may possibly get better results for them for at that time in their life with running another program. But what we knew was that there was uh, a huge misconception with this uh, intensity driven culture that we have right now that, you know, it's if you want to look a certain way or get the results, it's the harder you work at it. And that's the, all that matters. Yeah. Right? And that's all that matters. And, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Hence why so much energy is put into, listen, you could train two or three days a week and build an incredible physique. In fact, you're better off learning to do that first before you build on top of that and have this five day, six day, seven day a week type of regimen that's crazy high intense. Like that should take you years to progress up to that. And along the way, you should be seeing great results. Now that's speaking to 85 to 90% of the population. I'm not talking to some fucking hyper athlete or super bodybuilder that's been lifting since he was fucking 12. I'm talking to the masses, a majority, which is the people that we trained. And so when we program, there's things in there that we did that like, okay, taking that into consideration, 90% of the people that follow a protocol that's only three days a week, but a full body type of routine with the major lifts involved is going to blow away all these other programs that that's are out right. there. That's right. And here's the thing. Like when we create programs, we're, we're creating them for an avatar. So if we create, like when we create a maps performance, mm -hmm. we're thinking, okay, maps performance is for the person who's interested in functional athletic movement and performance. Maybe somebody who's attracted to CrossFit because of that. How would we design a workout for that type of person? Yeah, and Matt, then also have it lead into like a season. So you could use it as an off-season sort of a workout protocol. Exactly. All that stuff we kind of factored exactly. in. Exactly. But so here's what happens when I used to create programs for individuals. Like I didn't just sit down and say, okay, Mrs. Johnson or Mr. Smith, what are your goals? Want to build muscle, burn body fat? Okay, let me write your program. That's not how you write a program. Yes, your goals are important, but I got to know your exercise history. I got to start to decide. I got to look at your overall stress load because exercise is a stress on the body, and it's just adding to the all the other stress you have in your life. And if you have a lot of stress in your life, you don't have that much room for a whole lot of other stress. In fact, if I put too much on your body in combination with all the other stress that you have in your life, your body's not only not going to respond; it might go backwards. I'm gonna look at your movement patterns. I'm gonna look at your 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 uh, personality, like how dedicated and motivated are you? How realistic is it that you're going to come to the gym right. X amount of days a week? So that's how you create the perfect program is you got to plug all of that stuff in mm. and then you spit out a routine. And then even then I would train someone with a routine and the program would change month to month based on how their body was responding. Now with, with maps, of course, we don't have the luxury of talking to every single person of the 10,000 or however many thousands of people that have bought our program. We don't have that luxury. What we do have is an avatar, a general avatar based on our 
collective 60 years of experience of training people. And then we design programs for specific goals. You know, MAPS Aesthetic is for like your bodybuilder types and MAPS Anabolic is more for your average person who just wants to build muscle and so on and so forth. And then we design the routine. So you really have to base it on yourself. And there are general truths. Here's some general truths for you. Big gross motor movements seem tend to be more effective than single joint isolation type movements. Now that doesn't mean isolation movements don't have value. Yeah, they're not irrelevant. That means it just means literally what I said. Generally speaking, place more emphasis on gross and motor an, movements. An example that we talk we talk with Ben Pokolsky a lot, who's big time on the isolation thing. But here's the difference between like someone like Ben who's been building himself for so many years and has put in the the foundation and the hard work already that he has the luxury to isolate and focus on certain muscles to develop them because he specialized himself to like yeah, the nth degree 100 percent. where we know that a majority of people are nowhere near his level maybe we'll, maybe we'll never get to that yeah level. and we'll probably never get to that level and the, the majority of people are neglecting some of the most important movements like squatting like deadlifting like the overhead press like those three especially i mean most people are bench pressing that tends to be yeah. pretty stable but the deadlift the squat and the overhead press are the three next biggest movements you could possibly do and a good portion of people are completely ignoring them. And even the ones that aren't ignoring them, myself included, for many years, kind of sporadically put them in there when they should have been the nuts and bolts and the core of all of my programs. And we also know that training to failure all the time for most people is not only is it too much, so not only are you wasting your time and energy, but it's actually detrimental. Most people will do best stopping a couple reps short of failure. Most people will do best training their entire body between two to four days a week rather than training body parts once a week. Most people uh, will do best training with exercises that are more specific to their goals, especially if they have athletic or functional type goals. Like if you want to be a better swimmer, well, there's more carryover from some exercises than there are to others. And so that's, these are all important things to know. If you once you understand your recovery ability, once you understand the amount of time you can spend in the gym, maybe past injuries and movement and all that stuff. Like right now, I'm coaching someone who has got really, really bad uh, ankle mobility. So he sent me a video of his squat, and he can barely get down to parallel, and his feet, you know, pronate, and his knees start to collapse. And he's been working out for a long time. This person's not going to be squatting for a little while. I'm going to be having him do split stance exercises so we can get a full range of motion, and we're going to work on ankle mobility for a little while. So these are all these are all things you need to take into account when you're designing your routine. But the general truths are gross motor movements. Uh, remember, whatever you're asking for is what you're going to get. So the exercise and the intensity is pretty specific to the results you're going to get. You're going to get. Don't go to failure most of the time. Train the whole body two to four days a week. And then if you want to get more specific, you get one of our programs or you start to design your own. We really, I mean, we really designed them with the intent of not being programs to get to a certain point. Like, oh, follow Maps Anabolic if you want to build a bunch of strength. Sure, it's marketed that way. Sure, it's tagged that way. But really, they're all like tools, education tools. They're really mm-hmm. good templates. Yeah, they're really good templates for you to learn from. That's what, and we and there's tell carry them. over from each program. Right. And so that is the idea is that for somebody to go through that process so they can learn and they can then program even more specific to themselves, which is why too, again, if you have any of our programs and you don't have Prime or Prime Pro to go with it, like to me, that's a that's a must. Well, that is how really, that's how we taught somebody to program for themselves right. because it's like okay, here's a good template. We've already structured it for you. It's very basic. It's going to get you incredible results for about ninety percent of the population for sure. And then on top of that, here is this at home test that you should take yourself and find out where your imbalances are, yours specifically, and then here are movements to help those imbalances that you should integrate yourself into a program, whether it's maps or another one that you develop yourself. But that is really the intent of these programs. It's not get shredded in 30 days or 90 days or no. sell you on this thing. It's like, listen, go through this because you're going to learn a fuck ton. Yeah. The real the real value of it is that like, if you look at your body, it, like we're, we're trying to educate the body. You've, you've done a, a great job at going through the educational process of learning, you know, acquired knowledge from all different types of pursuits and different trades and skills and, you know, but 
as far as like what your body is capable of, mm-hmm. what kind of attributes you can add to your body, what, you know, what, what is, what are these adaptations uh, look like? And what, and, you know, to be able to feel and experience that, um, I, I feel like it's, it's very valuable because now you can understand your body specifically on such another level. I used to hate it when, when I would read uh, like muscle magazines or people would, I would talk to lifters when I was a kid. And I'd say, hey, what's what, what's the best routine for me? And they'd be like, well, you got to figure that out for yourself. I used to hate that. But there's some definitely some truth to it. However, I wish I had a good template. Like if somebody gave me an excellent template like MAPS back then, I would have learned my body way faster, right. way yeah. faster. But instead, I had to go through trial and error so many fucking times. Yeah. It took me years and years and years to figure that out and through training people and all that stuff. So I mean, my favorite people who who tend to comment are, are trainers who get the programs and then learn more about training other people because you know they're applying some of the stuff and figuring it out for themselves, and that's that's always exciting. Well, that's what I mean. You're right. I, when we first started this, obviously it was for the masses, but we realized that it's appealed a lot to trainers because it's now made all these trainers, but which is fucking awesome because yeah. I know we know that if we impact one single trainer, we now That's are- like five to 10 clients yeah, right there. Minimum, right? I mean, minimum, they're training five to 10 clients. I mean, now we potentially are affecting, you know, you know, five, 10 times the amount by going through a trainer, which is cool. Next question is from Joe Buns. Has hey, hey. CrossFit as a whole done more harm or good for the fitness industry? I, I think unequivocally, they've done more good uh, than harm for the fitness industry. Uh, and in, it's I'm, throwing a monkey wrench. In I there. am so. I could definitely argue it both ways. I I can, but I think I can argue the harm. But I think they've done way more good. And I I am so happy that I've been in the industry as long as I have because I could see a clear. It's almost like there was fitness, uh, you know, before CrossFit. I'm talking about the industry, the gym industry, before CrossFit and after CrossFit, and I could clearly see the changes. Before CrossFit, nobody. Nobody did barbell squats. For sure, nobody did barbell deadlifts. And for sure, women didn't do either one ever in the gym. <laughs> ever. Right, right. I would manage these 30,000 plus square foot facilities, like big old monster Right, which get an average clubs. of 1,500 to 2,000 workouts a Just day. Just lots of people coming in, and the entire gym, the whole gym would have one squat rack. And no one would use it. And it would be it would be dust dusty. all over. Yeah. The plates that the gyms would have, and still a lot of gyms have these plates because they bought them a while ago, would be these fucking hexagonal stupid plates that you never want to deadlift in. But it didn't matter because nobody ever deadlifted. And if you've ever deadlifted with a hexagonal plate, you know how dangerous that is when you put the weight down and it shifts and it's stupid, right? But that's because nobody deadlifted, so it didn't matter. Women, I had to convince women to use machines let alone use free weights. Like I had to use, convince them just to lift weights. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Then CrossFit comes into the scene. Next thing you know, guys are squatting, deadlifting. Women are lifting weights. They're in the weight room. They single-handedly did more for women's resistance training mm. than the gyms did in the previous, I don't know how many decades. Like yeah. single-handedly, CrossFit made no, it I cool think, for I think women we to all, I think we all agree on that. Yeah. Is, yeah. is hexagonal a word? I just, I don't know. Yeah, I Maybe. I think so. Is yeah. it? I think, you're okay. I think it would be hexagonal. hexagonal. I think it's hexagonal. hexagonal. Maybe. Is that, I would have just thought you say hexagon. If something's hex, if, hexagonal. If hexagon, hexagon weights would be the same, right? It's, it's hexagonal. I have to call hexagonal. them out. I've, I've heard hexagonal I feel like before. You I don't know if they misused it should, too. You should have looked it up before you're doing that. Yeah. Now, you, now you, now let's, uh, uh, no, no, I'm right. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, hexagonal. Of See, I got your back that time. So. Of or pertaining to a hexagon. Wait, wait, wait. wait. He- hexagonal is with A. There it is. No, that's, it is. I pronounced it wrong. Hexagonal. Hexog- uh, 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 hexagonal. Yeah, same you, thing. You, it's hexagonal. <laughs> it's the same word. <laughs> yeah, it's like electronical. Yeah. Oh, same no, no, no same I didn't different. make up a word. I, mean, I just could say it like that. Yeah. yeah. The pronunciation's wrong. Yeah. But, yeah. Hold on. Let's see what how it sounds. I don't know. There's a sound there. You should hold put on. it up I'm to gonna, the thing. I'm going to do it. Let me see. Let me see. Hexagonal. Hexagonal. Oh, not even close. Hex- hexagonal. Not even close. Hexagonal. But. Hexagonal. But you can see how I pronounce it wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, I think I think they've done a great job as far as like getting outside the commercial. Like it was basically, um, you know, the the backlash of like what that commercial type gym had created. Like it created Globo Gym. 
You know, this was like CrossFit was the answer to that. I think that they went super extreme with that idea. And, you know, it's brought positives and negatives. Like, you know, functional exercises, they've incorporated the whole thing is all functional. Like, they don't even bench press anymore. Like, it's mm. like not a thing, right? So, um, you know, there's, there, it's definitely has like this, this positive, uh, impact as far as like bringing good exercises back to popularity. But on top of that, they've also shit on specificity, which that's where I got angry because mm. it was just, it was like this, this, like, football, I don't football, care. Football teams are doing CrossFit walks. Yeah. Like that, that, oh my God, that, that makes my skin crawl because it's but, just, it's just not as effective. Yeah. And, and it's like, and, and then the justification was always like this, this, this huge, push of like oh no academia's got it all fucking wrong and you know and the, the, there was just no like critical um di there was no dialogue back and forth of like well can i be critical right now can i assess you know what you're programming um if that's like good like is that is that something that's going to apply towards this specific pursuit like no right, right. it's all yeah. just super general no what the, early on they and, and they're changing by the way i don't know if you guys knew this or not someone messaged me the other day but they're trying to separate the hardcore elite training from the everyday thank god and that, should, it should look nothing alike no and i think that's very no smart. different than it should be like if some kid who came in who's never worked out before it's like you do you want me to train like lebron james like no you have no business training like lebron yeah, james. Right. we're gonna train basics and whatever right um i i think some of the harm that they did they glorified early on intensity uh, like hardcore to the point where there was this like unofficial mascot for crossfit early on which was a it was a clown throwing up Mm -hmm. um, and Uncle Rabdo. And he was they on dialysis him. too, right? They, they called him Uncle yeah, he Rabdo. Carried this like machine around. R Rabdo is when you work out so hard that your muscles, you're, you get so much muscle breakdown that your kidneys get clogged and you actually get kidney failure. And that's they made a joke about that. So that was a bad thing. Um, the you know putting Olympic lifts into circuit based programming that was stupid. You should never ever do a highly complex, extremely um, you know technical lift like a a power clean or a snatch uh, when you're doing a, a circuit or fatigue-based routine. You just don't do those to fatigue because your form breaks down a little bit and then you're fucked. So that was pretty bad. They yeah. definitely uh, they definitely poked at the big gym business from a business standpoint because mm -hmm. before CrossFit, you want to make money in, 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 in gyms, you needed a big box. Yeah. You need a big box. So the, the irony in you going that direction is – because I was going to play devil's advocate because I thought you guys were going to stroke CrossFit off the whole time. So No way. But I agree. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I was counting on you to yeah, save us Hell there. no. No, but I, I, I do agree with Sal, though. I I think it has done more good than harm. So before I rag on him, I just I, I want to say that for I 100% agree because there wasn't anybody doing squats and deadlifts and overpress. I mean, you're talking about a, a percent of the percent out there that were doing that in the, in the fitness space. And so... And I think that's so good. I think that's so good for everybody that we're doing this. Now, that being said, I was talking to a trainer who's like in his early 20s and uh, looking to get into management in one of these big box gyms. And he's telling me that, you know, CrossFit has exploded so much that there is a huge culture within the normal gyms like 24s and Planet Fitness and stuff that are modeling their workouts mm. after all these watts. Mm -hmm. So... Here's what I'm worried about is trainers in these big box gyms were already kind of shitty trainers. You know, it's normally where you get your your first experiences in there, which I think is incredible for everybody. So it's not me talking. Not all, by the way. I was, yeah, yeah no, no. I'm, I'm over generalization. Sure, I sure. fall into that category too. So before you get fucking defensive, because I said that because you work at a big box gym, it's like, that's the truth. It's a great place to start. I think for everybody. And so you're not already a very advanced trainer. Now you're taking these people through these circuit based Routine. And you're having them snatch and clean and fucking plyos and. And even if you're not doing that, you're modeling it after it because of your clients. You're letting your client dictate your programming because it's because of something that's popular. Because CrossFit has become so popular, people that are coming in to that don't, don't want to pay one hundred eighty dollars a month for a membership at a CrossFit. They have a ten dollar a month Planet Fitness or twenty four mm -hmm. Fitness are coming in and they're asking to be taught how do how do I train like that? Which right. is why why we see these gyms now creating these little CrossFit type areas mm -hmm. within them because they're trying to compete with that. And so I think it's it's feeding into the worst part of the culture where 
what we should have done was taken out, unpacked, like, what has CrossFit done really good? Like, if I was still a manager within one of these facilities, what I'd be teaching my staff, so, you know, all of you managers listening, I, I would be teaching my staff that is t- teaching this type of training to my clients is, listen, let's let's unpack what was really good and what, what CrossFit has brought right. to fitness, and let's start to implement some of that into our training, which would be like, hey, let's teach your people how to squat. Let, let's make a real effort towards that, and let's work towards you know adding that to all clients, even if they say they can't or they don't want to. It's like that should be a goal of ours, mm-hmm. even if they can't do it right now. And so taking those things out of it that were so good versus – the marketable shit, which everybody is chasing after, which is the they just got intensity driven and the circuit based. They part. just got it wrong. What they did was, and I know what they did. You know, you have these big corporate gyms and these massive, uh, you know, boxes, and they looked at the model and they said, "Oh, you know, it's working. It's because there's a bunch of circuits and everybody's getting really sweaty and sore, and it's intense, and that's what people want." And they completely missed the boat. Completely. Now, for exercise standpoint, it's the effective exercises that was important with CrossFit. But here's the other piece that everybody fucking missed, okay? Fitness is, if you want it to be effective from a, from a business standpoint, if you want to have a gym that is truly successful from a business standpoint, there's a lot of factors. But one of the factors is, does it feel like you're walking into a community or does it, walk, does it feel like you're walking in and you're working out by yourself? Mm-hmm. Makes a big fucking difference. Mm-hmm. And gyms used to be... That community feel. In fact, one of the reasons why the gyms I managed were so successful, one of the reasons, was I created that feel in my gym. And I did it with my staff first because they're the ones that spread it. And the other way I did it is I would do events all the time in my gym. I'd have food in there. I'd have music. I'd have things going on. I'd talk to members. And people love that shit. And you know what CrossFit did really fucking well? That. You go to you ask anybody that works out in CrossFit. And you ask them what their favorite thing about CrossFit is. Yeah. It's community. And it's the community. Yeah, it's the and friends. gyms forgot that shit. In fact, it got. To That's also why it's such a cult too. Mm-hmm. That's right. Because you can't. T- you you. How are you going to tell somebody who won is probably in the best shape of their life now that they're training so fucking crazy, and then they've met friends. You know that they now potentially have for life because it's right. like going to war, dude. Yeah, you go to war every day. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, like, you, what does everyone always say about anyone they went to war with? They come back and like those are like brothers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like we are for lifelong brothers because of that experience. We both yeah. puked after that workout. They, yeah. they do. They cre- we both blew out our shoulders. They create the same a day. similar thing psychologically. Like they create a very yeah. similar thing psychologically that you're going to battle a war to accomplish to get through this wad. And if you get through it, like only some of us survive. Yeah. And it's like we've got this brotherhood but there, now. But there's also the community. Like when you go into a good CrossFit, you see the trainers talking to the members, the members talking to each other. You don't. You rarely see members with headphones on doing their own thing. I don't think they do ever. Yeah. Right. Right. And that that is powerful. I, I mean, I would get more. My the gyms I would run. You know, after a short period of time, would get more workouts, and I'd have better retention as a result of that creating that vibe. Listen, in the that's gym, how the it culture. started. We, I mean, we just got back from the the you know, the Mecca, right, the Venice, and you could see like what the gym used to look like when it first started. It was this little hole in the that's wall right. that you know probably had one or two speakers somewhere in there, if at all, if mm-hmm. there was even speakers in there. And you know, everybody, and you've seen everyone's seen the the movie before with with Arnold. It's like they're. They're pumping iron, right? Yeah. They're they're all they're doing is talking to each other. Everyone's you, guys yelling across the gym at you know Arnold doing squats on the other side. Like there was this great community, and then what happened? You know, it became very marketable, and there was money, and now, the, now there became an industry. Back then, it wasn't an industry. No, you, you know, no money. With there was that a couple all. gyms. It was like a small thing that people did, and then what ended up happening was this thing turned into something big, and then here comes big money. Big money comes in, finds a way to exploit it, to grow it. We were a part of that movement, right? We were a part of the exploiting process. At that time, we were fooled to think that this is yep. how it's supposed to be, looking back and reflecting now that we are a part of this you know, exploiting the, you know, people's emotions and feelings to want to be in shape, to want to be like Arnold. And so that's what you see. And now it's coming full circle. Yeah. I, it's coming back the other other direction. I think we can, we've done this actually. We've been in many gyms together. It, there's a few things that we look at, okay? But for sure, the three of us, we walk into a gym and we can tell within 10, 15 minutes if it's a successful gym or not. And one of them, one of the factors, there, oh, some of the factors are, the sales staff, the front desk, do they have systems, all that other stuff, right? All that business stuff. But the other thing is the vibe in the gym. I'll walk into a gym and I'll feel it right away and be like, oh, this gym's not successful. Or this gym is that you can feel it. And it's that community. It's that culture Mm -hmm. 
that you create within your facility. You know, big tax gym, you know, I'm not talking about all any other factor, not the business side or any of that stuff, but the culture in the gym they've got. You walk in, you can see people talking to each other, working together. The, the, the owner was talking to the members and you could feel that culture. And that's only one factor. It's not all of them, but it's an important factor. And that's something that CrossFit nailed down. And that's something that the big box gyms and of course, the staff makes a big difference, but we weren't taught this. This is just something that I did. It wasn't like it came down from management. This was my own flavor. That's something that the big box gyms forgot. Mm-hmm. Go to a big box gym now. Walk into your typical, you know, whatever, 24 Fitness, LA Fitness, or whatever, Planet Fitness. Walk in there, and members are in there by themselves, all by themselves. They got their headphones on. Nobody's looking at each other, whatever. You go into some other gyms with a different culture, you see people jumping in in between sets. You know, I, people don't even know what that that etiquette anymore. Like, you go into a big box gym and someone's on a machine, you can walk up to them and say, "Hey, can I jump in?" They'll probably look at you like you're crazy. Like, yeah. What does he mean, jump in? <laughs> yeah. What, you know, we're gonna jump me. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. No. In in a good culture of a gym, people know exactly what's going on. Oh yeah, absolutely. Go ahead and jump in. I'll help you rack the weights or whatever. Like, it's a totally different vibe. And CrossFit got that right. And I and unfortunately, I don't think the rest of the fitness industry picked up on that. I really don't. Yeah. But they did pick up on the. Circuits and shit like that, which is yeah, yeah, funny. Yeah. Picked up on all that shit. Next question is from Michelle Salvis. I'm trying to lose 30 pounds of baby weight at 18 months postpartum. A trainer at my small box gym recommends higher reps over heavier weight during class style workouts. I prefer building strength with heavier weights, but should I take his advice? No. <laughs> yeah. No. Pro- probably not. Unless you're like a, unless you train like a power lifter forever, and then in which case the right, yeah, no, the higher reps, that'd that'd be the only scenario. That would be the depends, right? So there'd be well, it depends if you were, you know, because she didn't give us that. Like if you had just, if you've been training in that three to five rep range for the last three, six, or whatever time months, then absolutely that trainer could be giving you great advice that maybe you should do a more you know, higher rep range or circuit base or shorter rest periods. Like you could probably benefit from that if that's how you, if you've been giving yourself long rest periods yeah. and training really, really heavy, but more than likely, at least in my experience, most especially postpartum, right. They're she not. probably didn't work out for a little while or whatever. Now here's the deal. Like the high reps class style workouts burn more calories per time uh, being done. In other words, one hour of high rep circuit style or class style workouts will burn more total calories than a hour of traditional strength training with heavier weights. But that's not the whole picture. That's actually just part of the picture. And it's not that many more calories. You're looking at the difference of maybe, you know, 400 calories and 250, okay? Not a huge difference. The other part of the equation that's very important is how are they going to affect your metabolism and how that how your metabolism is going to affect your total calorie burn on an everyday basis. You would rather have a faster metabolism and a body that is prioritizing strength uh, over a body that's trying to become efficient because you're burning a ton of calories with lots of endurance style, style training. You're gonna, you'll end up screwing yourself if you do that all the time with, where you'll, you'll get this metabolic adaptation where your metabolism starts to slow down. And I used to love, I used to love doing this with women where they'd come in and I'd say, no, we're going to focus on strength. We're going to focus on traditional resistance training. And you're not going to lose a ton of weight initially, but watch what happens. Give us a few months and watch what happens. And the people that would stick with it, sure enough, they'd come to me and be like, I feel like the weight's falling off me. I'm not even doing anything crazy and my body's just getting leaner. And I tell them, like, your metabolism is speeding up. Your hormones are balancing out. Like, this is exactly what you want to do with your training. Especially if you're being fed. I think a mistake that some of these people will get when they're trying to lose 30 pounds or more is the initial get into your weight training, whatever it is, whether it be low reps or and circuit, cut your calories and then cut your calories. Like I would, I would make you keep your calories. If I want you fed, if you're hungry, I want you fed right now. And then I'm going to start strength training with you at the beginning. And our goal at the first month may not to be to lose any weight whatsoever. Like we're going to build some muscle. I promise you, if you haven't been lifting weights and I put you in a, you know, like a, a maps anabolic phase one type of routine where you're lifting that three to five rep range, like you're going to build some muscle. And so if at the end of the month we're, 
you know, maybe a pound lighter or the same even, or even a pound up, like we're, we're kicking ass in my opinion, because then I know that for sure you're going to be a building muscle. If you're feeding the body and you're also giving it a stimulus like that, the big mistake I see people make is they may be giving the right stimulus, but then they're not feeding, they're starving their body because they're trying to race to that, losing mm-hmm. that 30 pounds. So don't make that mistake. It's so hard to, and I've seen both sides of this. I've, I would have, I would see people in the gym who were the cardio mm-hmm. bunny, you know, lots of reps, class style workouts, and then they get pregnant and they try and keep it up. And, and they, they weren't overweight, but they weren't super lean. They were just kind of maintaining their health. And then they'd have the baby and then afterwards they gain the weight. And then they try that same approach and I would just watch them. It would just be this uphill, difficult battle of trying like a to hamster spend, wheel. Yeah, trying to spurn tons of calories constantly over and over again, yeah. especially after having a baby. Boy, that's difficult. And then on the other end of the si- spectrum, I would see people that would come in who were like these women who like to lift weights and they have these very sculpted bodies because they always lifted weights and then they would get pregnant and they would bounce back so fast. Yeah. Like so, so fast. We, we have members in our forum who take videos of themselves working out like two months or something like that post post baby and they look phenomenal and they were like hard and you know heavy into the resistance training makes a tremendous tremendous difference i can't stress it enough yeah at the end of the day when you have a solid frame that you know you've built muscle upon like that's that's where like turning the the calorie burn kind of sequence on and off like that that's where it all starts to kind of play out the way you want but like going through the process of building the muscle and like getting a nice uh, foundation established is so crucial mm-hmm. and allow yourself to kind of go through that process. It's not like this, this, this race, like right out of the gates. Like I have to shed, 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 which is such a trap. I mean, that's something like, I mean, my wife even went through that the, the second, because the, the workouts were different going into our, our second kid. And, um, it's just, it's one of those things like it, you get this panic about it, you know? And like, I understand it because, you know, (laughs) having to deal with that mindset, it's, it's, it's inside of a lot of us. Like we want to get to that goal. Mm -hmm. We want to get to that and smash the goal, but you're going to set yourself up for more problems down the road. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it just traditional resistance training is one of the best things you could do in the context of modern life to maintain a lean body because it speeds up your metabolism better than anything. And you know, how often have you guys heard this from women? Like, oh my God, me and my husband go on a diet and I lose three pounds and he loses just 10 pounds right away. Well, he's got more muscle. Right. Mm-hmm. He's got a lot more muscle. This is why men, you know, this is why that stereotype or that, right. you know, that, that, that doesn't get talked about. That's right. why it exists yeah. is that guys tend to have more muscle. And when guys go to work out, they're less likely to do the tons of cardio. Right. And when women will go to work out, and that's just because we've been advertised differently. That's all it is. It's just, you know, it's it's less it's you know less acceptable for women to go lift weights for their workout than it is for them to go t- take a, a class, a, some type of a, a aerobics class or a dance class or something like that. And the opposite for men. Like it's less likely, you know, less acceptable for a man to go take a bunch of classes than it is for, for him to be like, oh, I'm just going to go to the gym and lift some weights. It's that resistance training that makes the big difference, especially, especially postpartum because you lose a lot of muscle and you know strength. How you know how we're going to know when that's changed? When you walk into a gym and they have two to three weight room floors. Yes. You know, that has- it's a, still yeah. the opposite. It's still the opposite. Yeah. You can- Double you, cardio. You, yeah, yeah. You go in at five o'clock at night into any gym across the country right now and that every piece of equipment is being is being used cardio yeah uh, being yeah. used and there's so and there's so that means there's probably double to triple the amount of people doing cardio than there is in the gym and lifting weights and so i think when that that's when i feel like when our message will have resonated with with the industry long enough will you start to see the gyms having to respond to that going holy fuck like yeah, there's a lot tr- of demand for right. free weights I mean, there's always treadmills open because we have fucking 90 of them you know Dude. what i'm saying like there's a, there's if there's 120 people in here you know what i'm saying and 90 of them are on these treadmills it's like when we no longer have a need for 90 treadmills in our gym and we need two to three to four weight floors or three to four to five sets of every weight of dumbbell like that's when you know shit's Dude, just, changing Jessica right and I were, were coaching this this one client who was a long distance. She was an endurance. She liked to do the, the running. She liked to run a lot. And she wanted to lose body fat. And she had just had a baby. And she would send me her food logs. And she was running anywhere. I think she was running between, uh, between 12 to 17 miles a week. So decent amount of running. Not a super ton, but 
decent amount of running. And this woman, first off, she was she had the skinny fat, right? So she wasn't heavy, but she wasn't very sculpted or whatever. And that was her big issue. She wanted to tighten up her body. She would, she looked exhausted all the time, and that was another issue she had. But she was still doing her running. She'd send me her food logs, and this woman was barely consuming 1,300 calories a day. You know, running 17 fucking miles or 12 Crazy. to 17 miles a week. And I told her, I'm like, listen, here's the deal. Like, we got to switch things up, and it's going to take a little while, but... Your two options are run twice as much, eat less, or we speed up your metabolism. And we know what the other one's going to like. Do you really think that's going to be sustainable, especially now with two kids? And so we had to like reverse out of it and increase her protein and slowly increase her calories and have her focus on resistance training. But her body started changing and she started tripping out. And it was so crazy to her because, and I've seen this so many times, it's a trip because it's like, this is what they feel like. Oh my God, I'm doing so much less work but my body's responding so well. It feels like magic. And it's like, no, you were just spinning your tires in the dirt before. You were literally trying to dig a ditch with a spoon and I've now handed you a fucking backhoe right. and, you're, and you're tripping over how much faster you're progressing, but it's just because we're just more effective. Yeah, you're working with your body. That's it. So, And with that, look, a lot of people don't realize that we're all on Instagram where you can actually find our personal pages with different information. You can find our personal flavors on Instagram, my page is Mind Pump Sal, Adam is Mind Pump Adam, and Justin is Mind Pump Justin. Go check us out. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.